are you? I'm all right. How you doing? I'm all right. I got a little wounded. Willie boy, uh, give me a little nick on the head. He's big paws, scratch. What is that mug? Is that Willie on the mug? That's uh, my old dog. That's well, maybe uh, that's not. Maybe Willie's jealous. He sees that and he gets mad. Yeah. Yeah, that's Bobby and Carly. Those are my dogs that maybe. both passed away. I had maybe Willie saying, "Where's my mug? Where the fuck is my mug? Forget about them. They're dead." Let's move on. That's what he's probably saying. Took a swipe at me. <laughs> uh, I heard from Robin Green. So I want to clarify a couple of things. Robin Green uh, with Mitchell Burgess wrote many, some of the best Soprano episodes and is a good, good, great, dear friend of ours. Her brother, we spoke about her brother was a psychiatrist and there was that scene, you know, we spoke about in the, uh, in the Sopranos where uh, we related it to what's a psychiatrist, psychologist responsibility when a crime, especially something serious like a murder is revealed to them. What happened, Robin Greene's brother uh, received a child molester as a patient. What happened was this guy abused his own daughter and she didn't bring up charges until she was an adult. So maybe 20 years after the case. And the judge, because it happened so long ago, the judge said, you don't have to go to jail. You can go to therapy. So he goes to see Robin Green's brother who says, you'd be better off if you turned yourself in and told the judge you need to go, you need to do time for this, that that would be better than any therapy I can give you. Wow. And I'm not going to treat you. And he walked out and said, go fuck yourself. The, the guy, the criminal said, go fuck yourself and walked out of the office. And he never did time, assuming, and let's hope he I never, don't know. I mean, I don't let's think hope he, he never him. molested anyone ever again. I don't, I don't know. know. That's not, he doesn't know, but that's the real story. So uh, we didn't get the whole thing. She also mentioned something interesting to me from last episode. Do you remember the scene when Ralphie has to apologize to Tony Soprano in the Vesuvio? Paulie and Christopher are watching. Tony refuses to get up. It's very, it's very humiliating. Yes. Yes. Tony pretends he doesn't know what's going, why he's there and what he's talking about. And he really makes Ralphie bow and scrape, as Ralphie says. That was inspired by David Chase was reading a book about the Civil War. And uh, apparently when Robert E. Lee surrendered to U Ulysses S. Grant, Grant made sure he humiliated himself in the process. He made wow. sure that Robert E. Lee humiliated. It wasn't enough just to surrender. It was done in a very humiliating fashion, and that's what that scene was inspired by. Wow, that's interesting. Made yeah. him grovel. He was groveling. Made him it. grovel. It wasn't enough. Wow. Made him Like you do with me about the first day of you on set, like how you make me <laughs> force me to apologize. That's, but you're We're not going to go into that today. But no. the thing is, you've never apologized. Well, because I don't feel one is necessary. That's know, the problem. That is the problem. That <laughs> that's, is the problem. that's it in a fucking nutshell. That's it in a nutshell. I got to tell you, I've been watching Barry, the HBO series. Uh, Great series. Great. Created by Bill Hader and Alec Berg, star starring Bill Hader, and I'm loving it. Uh, and um, I'm loving all of it. Uh, but Henry Winkler... Uh, you know, I, I've studied acting with a bunch of different teachers and he plays an acting teacher and it's really fun watching him. I think he does a great job. The very, the only fan mail, fan letter I ever wrote in my life was, was to Henry Winkler when he was the Fonz, when I was wow. a little kid. That's in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. And they sent back this little postcard photo. With Do you a still photo. have it? No. I mean, that was 50 years ago, probably. I don't know. You know, uh, I, I know got, you're friends with him, right? I got to be friendly with Henry. I just heard from him a few weeks ago. And it was his birthday. And uh, I wished him happy birthday, and he sent me a message. Uh, I met Henry in the early 2000s, 2002, three, one, somewhere like that. Uh, he was the executive producer of Hollywood Square. And uh, I was doing Hollywood Squares early on in the Soprano years. And I would go, I was living in Vegas, would go take my young daughter on a Saturday and we would do five shows in a day. And it was a lot of fun to me. You made some money, some extra money, and it was a lot of fun. And you see all these people, you know, I mean, Alec Baldwin and, and uh, Dom DeLuise and Joan Rivers and 
uh, Elmo and MC Hammer and, and a whole array of celebrities from all, all walks of life. And I would go and uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. Henry was the exec producer. We became friendly. I did it a bunch of times. He couldn't be a better guy. There's no one in Hollywood says a bad thing about Henry Winkler. And, uh, you know, he does. I remember I hadn't seen him for a while. And then I saw him and I said, he said, what's doing? What have you been up to? I said, you know, Henry, the season ended and I'm just banging away, man. Just banging away, you know. And he said, let me tell you something. You will always just be banging away. You know, in other words, you got to do what you got to do, you know. Uh, uh, career wise, downs. You know, I mean, I did books. I've done hosting. I've done correspondent stuff. I've I've done a whole bunch of things, acting, in addition to voiceover. I do a lot of voiceover stuff. And that's what his point was. And that was some of the best uh, kind of advice because, you know, you're thinking, well, I'm on The Sopranos, the best show in history. I'm going to be set from here on out. He was the biggest star on TV. Absolutely. So nobody knows better than, uh, uh, you know, uh, Henry Winkler. He was the Fonz. He's an iconic TV character. Yeah. Yeah. And it took him 40 years. He finally won an Emmy Award. And has all, he's all, though he's always worked, uh, he has Director an Emmy Award actor, for yeah. Barry and... I mean, he's done everything, you know. Uh, I think I want to say he may have produced The Equalizer. Could he be one of the producers on a show like that? Possibly. He's a great uh, – and Barry, he's really, really good. Great. And very funny and just dead on. And yeah. the scenes with him and Bill Hader. Uh, Bill Hader's great in the show yeah. as well. The two of them together are awesome. Um, well, I'm what really I like it. about it, it's not your typical Italian hitman. It's a complete different take on this thing. And it's uh, very funny, very creative. Uh, and uh, Henry finally got what he deserved, though he's very respected. I mean, he's a Yale drama guy. Right. And then he took the role of Fonzie. He well, he did The Lords of Flatbush. Remember that one? Yes. with uh, Sylvester Stallone. Stallone. It was Perry Ray, King. Ray Sharkey? I don't think it was Ray Sharkey. It was Perry King, Stallone, um, Henry Winkler. I forget who the other guy was. It was going to be Richard Gere and Richard Gere and Stallone were like ready to go to blows. They, they couldn't get, get along. along. And I think Richard Gere either quit or they let him go. I don't know the whole story, but I know Richard Gere was cast at one point in that movie. You know, after Lords of Flatbush, I, and I, I think we talked about it. I'm not sure, but 1975, I went to John Jay college. So, I uh, would walk around the city, you know, like I had basketball practice later, so I would be all over Manhattan. And I used to run into some celebrities. And Sylvester Stallone was a security guard in Manhattan in 1975. Like in you the saw 50s, him around? I saw him. And I said, hey, you're that guy from the movie. And he said, no, nah, no, nah, not me. I said, yes, that's you. And he said, no, he denied it. I'm telling you. He so was before a Rocky, but after Lords before of Flatbush. Rocky. So he was still banging it out. He hadn't hit, he wasn't a star yet. Lords yeah. of Flatbush was basically almost like an independent movie. They probably weren't paying much yeah, money. And there was nothing there, you know. It kind of got popular, I think, as the years went on. Uh, you know, uh, but it just goes to show you, you know, uh, you kind of up, you know, like the tide goes in, the tide goes out. You're on top of the world. Yeah. And you often think, you're working, but people don't know it. Because yeah, if you're yeah. on something that's so visible, like Happy Days or like The Sopranos, everyone knows what's going on. And yeah. then you're on something smaller or you're doing theater or you're doing, you know, something that not a lot of people see and they don't know that you're working. You're doing indie movies or whatever. A, a, a large part of your, your audience doesn't know. And there's a lot of stories you know, I love the kind of comeback stories of people who have like a or second or third act, you know what I mean? It's like they were, uh, like Mickey Rourke's a good example. I yeah. mean, Mickey, who came out of the box doing incredible work, you know, Pope of Greenwich Village, 
I mean, he was just tremendous in, and I think Body Heat was might have been his first movie role. He had a he had a small role in that, but a really memorable a one. Memorable role. Then, then he was in half, Diner. He was in eight Diner. Eight and a half weeks. Diner was a big one for him, and he's of course Pope of Greenwich Village. He becomes a big star. fantastic. Yeah, Angel yeah. Heart, and then you know there were years where he wasn't working, or he was working in movies that not a lot of people were seeing. And then he comes back with The Wrestler in a tremendous, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, a career performance, really. And absolutely, that put him back. absolutely. But it, it happens. But, you know, the thing that people are fooled by, they think once you're on TV or started a movie that that's it, you're set, you made it, you know, whatever made it means to people. You know, uh, being rich isn't making it. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all levels of what's making it, right? I mean, Being happy uh, to me is making it. Yeah, of course, you know. L listen, I worked, and then I remember after Sopranos, I was on Secret Life to American Teenager. You did uh, an episode, but a lot of people didn't see it. It was a high school show, and people were going, well, when are you going to come back on TV? When are you, when are you going to be working again? I, I am working. It's just maybe, like you say, something you don't see, but there are those actors it goes right to their fucking head and they think look i remember somebody on the sopranos saying to me one of the actors we were in las vegas ready to do an appearance and he said do you believe we're stars we're stars me and you and i said i'm not a star man i'm just a actor working actor just trying to you know make a living and be happy doing it and I never thought of myself in those terms, and I still don't. I just want to work, and that's what makes me happy. But there are all those people that went right to their head. And how many times do we have to hear that same story? He hit it big. He became a star. And then he became a prick. And he tripped over his dick, and he never worked again or worked a lot less and down, down, down. We've heard it over and over and over. Am I right? Well, sometimes it has to do with their behavior on set and their sure. attitude. Listen, if you're a big giant star, that's that's a box office guarantee. They'll put up with whatever the hell you do until but until you're not. You until, know, until you're not, because when you're not, they're not going to put up with it. No, they'll put up with all the nonsense until you know your movie busts out. Listen, you but know who made a big comeback? Alec Baldwin. Now, really? Alec Baldwin, yes, really got hot, big star, uh, married to the mob. Uh, the marrying man, and then he had a lull. Like I said, we're not saying he didn't work. None of these examples are people that didn't he work. He was but, doing Broadway. But he's done everything. He is bulletproof, Alec Baldwin. Does commercials, Broadway, he does comedy. 30 Rock brought Alec Baldwin back. He had a lot of bad publicity with his daughter and that whole thing. And he was, and he's got a bad temper. And 30 Rock, he was brilliant in. And, you know, he's on top of the world again. And let me tell you, he does everything. He does Broadway. He did a sitcom, commercials. He hosted the game show. What was game that? Game show? I think Pyramid? he still does. Yeah. No, to tell the truth or match game, match game. So that was a big one. I mean, he's, he's kind of like Teflon, Alec Baldwin. But he had a lull there. And suddenly he came back bigger than ever, you know. Robert Downey Jr., that's a good oh, one. Oh, that's know, the biggest. He was a huge star when he was young. He did Chaplin. I, did he win the Oscar for Chaplin? He, I think he was nominated. Certainly nominated. And then, you know, his drugs got the best of him for a while. He went to jail. Yeah. I think oh, he went no. to jail for almost a year. Probably the biggest comeback. You know, this is a guy that you would have said. Super talent. Oh, he always was always interesting. Anytime you see him in any role, and any do movie. Do you know him? You ever work with him? I don't know him. I've never met him. I like his work a lot. I think he's great. He's always been great. He was on Saturday Night Live for a, a season. Yeah, for a remember, season. Yeah. yeah, him and uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Right. Remember him? Yeah. Uh, Jason Bateman. Jason Bateman was a child actor. Uh, well, child actors are a different thing. Yeah, but he had a child actor. Had a tough time. Had a little drug alcohol problem, comes back with Arrested Development. He's starring in movies. He's producing in movies. Ozark is a huge hit. He's the lead in that. Horrible Bosses. I mean, uh, 
you know, a ton of movies. Became a producer. You know, he's married to Paul Anker's daughter. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. One of his daughters. Jason Bateman made a big comeback. Travolta. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, Quentin Tarantino has done that in several instances. Think about Pam Greer with Jackie Brown. Travolta with Pulp Fiction, Harvey Keitel with Reservoir Dogs, Robert, Dog, Foster, Robert, Robert Foster. Foster with Jackie, Jackie Brown, Brown. Which, Jackie Brown, and he, you know, because he loves actors and people that he grew up with and always admired. He he made a point of of uh, giving them work, which is really cool. Neil Travolta Patrick. really was doing, you know, he was doing kind of bad comedies, and then really wasn't doing much. And Pulp Fiction put him back on top. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In a big way, too. Then Get Shorty, which he was great in. Both Get Shorty. Did get several Shorty movies with Jim, Jim, with Jim yeah. Gandolfini. Jim yeah. liked him a lot, and yeah. he, he helped Jim. Jim had a lot of good things to say about him. He did, yeah. Uh, and Alec Baldwin helped Jim also. Uh, he also made that terrible Scientology movie. That was, I haven't seen that one. That was really bad. Really, really you, bad. You know what else? Uh, Michael Keaton with yes. Birdman. That was a big comeback for him. But, you know, I think his, when I say comeback, I think that he was, you know, he dropped out on his own. He went, I think, to live yeah, in the I, country. And I'm not saying that they all went. You no, know, neither am I. But it's, but it's interesting just to see how at one point you, everyone's talking about you, everyone's seeing you and everything, and then there's this lull. And then, I think you know, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Yeah, it's gonna happen. It doesn't doesn't just keep going up, up, up. No. Look at Burt Reynolds. He was once the biggest box office star. Biggest box star, box office star in Hollywood, right? Then he overspent. He comes broke. Bad publicity. A divorce. And uh, at, at at one point, he couldn't get arrested. And then he did this. The Boogie last Nights. movie star, Boogie Nights, it was a big comeback for him. Big one, yeah. And then this last movie he did, the last movie star, directed by Adam Rifkin, who helped me early in my career. Uh, he was uh, great to me. And I think he probably died pretty happy because he kind of was somewhat on top again, Burt Reynolds. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, how about Neil Patrick Harris? Don't Doogie know. Hauser? Neil Patrick Harris was in Doogie Hauser. Yeah, but the kid the thing league. is a little different to me because yeah, just right. because you're as successful as a kid, there's no guarantee you're going to – translate into a, a no adult but then he may, you don't see him for a long time and then he comes back with how i met your mother wins emmys uh stole that show winds up hosting the tonys and the emmys you know huge huge uh, if you want to call it a comeback you know yeah no i mean that's a general term art carney who wound up winning the oscar for paul mazursky's harry and tonto you know i mean there was big lulls. Art Carney had a bad alcohol problem. He was the, you know, he was the original Felix Unger in the play, Odd Couple. I didn't know he was a, had an alcohol problem. Terrible. He went away several times to sanitarium and stuff. He oh, was wow. doing Odd Couple on Broadway, and it opened, and he had to go away. I didn't know that. He suffered terribly, terrible you know, alcohol. You know who else? Fred and Mertz. And then, then he Fred. won the uh, Oscar for, for Harry and Tonto. What would you say? Fred Mertz. You know, Ethel and Fred on the Lucy show. What was his name? Uh, William H. Frawley, something like yeah. that. Yeah. He was a bad alcoholic and they didn't get along. Vivian Vance and him. His drinking. He was much older than her. He had a drinking problem that kept under control. Otherwise, uh, you know, with Desi Arnaz. I didn't, yeah. have, I didn't know about Arcani, but, you know, I, I got to tell you, the... the uh, you know, I guess the saving grace kind of, you know, in a way, Michael. It, Marlon Brando made a big comeback also. With The uh, Godfather? Yeah. He didn't have yeah. a good movie for 10 years, Godfather. Yeah. He wins uh, his second Academy Award. You know, he was only like 47 when he did The Godfather. He looks so much older. You know, He, he so was older. not that much older than the other guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Robert Downey Jr., he... Uh, you know, he had, believe it or not, Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson helped him. He put up the bond money. They wanted to hire him for a movie. And what a lot of people may not know out there, you know, when you do a movie or a TV show, it has to be, you have to be insured. So if you're one of the leads in the movie, you have to take a physical and make sure uh, you're not a risk because if you're one of the leads and you run off in the middle of the movie, and the movie shuts down, there's millions and millions of dollars at stake. 
Right. So they wouldn't take a chance on his insurance bond. Mel Gibson had confidence in him and put up the money. That's cool. And that that that's uh, that kind of paved the way. We, Winona Ryder got caught up in the whole shoplifting thing. Winona Ryder in Black Swan was fantastic. That was one of her comeback uh, roles. You know, she was fantastic in that movie. I, I love that movie. Yeah, I love Aronofsky. I think he's he's amazing. But uh, now Nat- um, it's it's Natalie Portman's a star that's very good. Natalie Portman and is it Mila Kunis is in it too? I think. If I'm yeah, mistaken, but right? Winona Ryder was fantastic in that. But but you know, uh, she got caught up. Whatever, she was a big star. Got caught shoplifting in Beverly Hills. Kind of a See, it's a good deal. thing you've never gotten caught. I mean, Steve is a kleptomaniac, but he's never gotten caught. That's never the secret. Got never got caught. In fancy it. boutiques, right? I like to change the receipts. You do That's the, why you, I wear all these You do the switcheroo. Clothes. Yeah. I just change receipts. <laughs> like, like if it's something like $500 pair of shoes, I put like $22 on it. All right. I'll pay something. I'll pay something. I'm not a complete piece of shit. You, know, you change the it, price tag, you mean? Price tag, yeah. Oh. That's what I do. That's, that's called the old switcheroo, right? Back in Brooklyn, that's what you call that. <laughs> uh, and, and she also made a huge comeback when Ona Ryder in Stranger Things. Huge hit on Netflix. Stranger Things, yeah. Huge hit. And so look, I there's hope stole, for us. I, there's hope for us, Steve. I haven't stole anything since I'm a kid. I stole since a comic a, book when I was a kid, and it... it Really disturbed me a lot. Yeah, since I'm a kid. When I was a kid, steal candy. I I I I, I dined and ditched, like as a teenager. You know, I ran out without paying in a diner. I would actually, we would actually go in with no money. How's that? There's celebrities that do that. How's that for stupidity? Hey, I caught Gabe Kaplan. I caught Gabe Kaplan walking out on his tab. (laughs) Well, he's Gabe Kaplan. Come on. Welcome back, Carter. And he knew. He knew he walked out. But he, you should have comped him. He's a big star. No. no. Well, fuck that. Why comp him? Nobody comps us. And if they do, I certainly wouldn't expect it if someone's nice enough and to... And if they do, you give them a big tip. A obviously. huge tip. And, and plus, I don't expect it. Like some people, hey, we're in your restaurant. We're, you know, you know, we're not supposed to pay. Well, I don't what, expect anything anymore. What the fuck is that? You know, uh, but... I got to tell you, I think we've seen so many people that were on shows in the 70s, the 80s, uh, and you never saw them again. They were big stars. And for whatever reason, you can't strike, you know, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the saying is, you can't. I think the problem is a lot of people get, if you hit it big right away, there's the pressure to now to, the pressure is to either hit it bigger in the next job or make more money or something of equal thing instead of just going back to the drawing board as an actor. Yeah. I think the people that are, that are, that do that are willing to go back to the drawing board. All right, let's do, we'll do a play. We'll do a little movie. We'll do this. Those people wind up staying the people who hit it big and then they got to hit it. The, the agents or the managers or themselves are saying, you got to be on another hit this time. You're going to be the star. This time yeah. you got to make more money when you're chasing that. You know, I also think, uh, and I agree with you there for sure. I, I also think uh, that people just, it just gets away from them. They believe the hype. They start believing, you know, they have no friends. Everyone's yesing them. Their manager, uh, their, their publicist, everyone, you know, their publicist, you're the best, you're the best. Bad behavior. And I think there's a lot of that also. You so know? you never and, believed that hype? I don't believe. Michael, this is the truth. I don't believe when people would say, you're great, you're great, the thing, da, 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 da. I don't believe that. I also don't believe when they tell me I'm shit. And there's plenty of those people. I'm you're, not buying it either way. Okay? You're so, a very balanced individual, Steve. Well, God so bless you're being, you. You're being fucking sarcastic. No, you are. <laughs> That's a very good attitude. That's I mean, why, I, you, I'm not that's gonna why be- you've been able to keep going. I, I mean, not everybody has that attitude. You know, I'm not going to believe, you know, listen, when I go in for an audition and I know some actors and you do also, uh, they want feedback, feedback. I, I, I know that they said I was great. 
<laughs> they loved you, but they're I not giving you the part. I don't give a shit if you think I'm great. I'm going to go in. I'm going to do the best I can. Either give me the part or not. I don't want to hear if you love me or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm way beyond that now. You know, you got good. All I got really good feedback. That's not making me feel good. And no. if they said I sucked, I know when I suck and when I don't suck. I know myself. You know when know, you do a good audition or when you don't. Yeah. That's right. And I know when I'm doing a scene right now. I know if the scene's working or it's choppy. I know. I feel it. I've do you been feel doing that on the podcast time. on this sometimes? I, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Things, we, we need something <laughs> at times. You know, and listen, the saving grace, I guess, this, this is something. You were a star on a sitcom or on a show, whatever. It goes away. And like you say, you continue to try to capture that. And not everybody can handle that. And that's why no. people have a lot that's of right. problems. That's right. Drug problems. Uh, just Marriage problems problem. in general. There's a lot of problems. They can't. It, it, just give it to me one more time. And maybe it's like being in love. I, get, I got a little taste of it. It went away. And I can't get it back. Yeah. You're right. You know, and, and, and honestly, I, you know, I don't know. Is what's worse, never having it or having it and it slipped away? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it depends on the individual and where they're at, you know, because it could destroy you. It destroys some people. Some people die. Yeah. Well, I think so. Yeah. Also, they die well, of, I, of addiction. They die of over, you know, overdose, yeah. I, you know, I also, without a doubt. I also don't know if it's, I mean, it's a, it's a job. It's a way to make a living. I, I love doing it. Uh, does my whole life revolve around it? Mine doesn't, you know, mine doesn't. You know, I mean, uh, personally, if I didn't act, if I didn't act again, you know, I'm not going to. Well, well, there's a difference though, between the work and the business. There's a difference. You know what I mean? It's a, and, and being engaged in your work, if you love it, no matter what you're doing, if you're writing or you're, you're doing a play or you're doing an indie movie, I mean, I like to be engaged creatively. It's not the same thing as being in the newspapers for the newest hit hit show or hit movie. It's There's two different things. You know. Well, you listen, gotta, you've worked steady this entire time. Okay? Yeah. You've, had, you've had numerous shows, numerous pilots. You haven't had luck with many of the pilots. They let, you know, they never went. You've yeah. been on series, three different series, at least one year at a clip. You were the lead More in 187, uh, Life on Mars. Life on Mars at Troy 187, Mad Dogs, Alex, Inc. I did one season on Californication, but that was the last season of the show. That wasn't the first. So, I mean, you've been working steady, but yet I'm sure you people go, hey, when are you going to see you again? Well, yeah, been, all the time. You know, well, what, mean, what a lot of people also don't know is, so you do one season of a show, it gets canceled. One season of a TV show is a good gig for an actor. Sure. Yeah, sure. Would you like to be on the next Sopranos and go for seven years? Of course. But if they would have said to you, this show is only going to go for one season, take it or leave it, I would do it. Of course. Of course. And, and the thing is, I don't know if people realize how hard it is. Even the worst piece of shit show on TV, the worst show that you see, you go, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Do you know what it took to get it right. on the air? That you beat out a lot of shows to get on the air. That's right. You have to audition for the pilot. Then you have to go test for the network, depending on your level, of course. You're a huge star. Yeah, well, you don't, have to, you don't have to audition anymore. Sometimes. Okay. But so I have to audition for the pilot then they want to fly me to la to test i test for the show if i get it or i don't get it okay we're going to shoot the pilot now you wait months and months to see if your the pilot's going to go if it does go they're going to give you six they're going to give you 12 or 13 then you're going to wait to see if you get the back end right. it is Jumping through hoops every step of the way. Hey, you and Jeff made me audition for the podcast. You weren't sure if I would be able to handle it, if I would be interesting. I mean, I had to work for this. It wasn't easy. I, you know what? And you came through with flying colors. You know, I hope you so. You really did. You, you came through. You know, All listen, right. it, you were neck and neck. I don't want to mention the other actor. <laughs> I have a feeling I know who it is. Yeah, you were neck and neck. We'll talk about that. Let's take a break. Come Let's back. take a break. 
We are back. Very good, man. Uh, this was a good episode. Did you like this one? Uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of a quiet episode for a finale. I know the tradition of The Sopranos is um, is not like the finale of a se- Usually the, tw- uh, the penultimate one, the one before the finale, is, is the shocking one. Um, well, there was no surprises here. No surprise. It's kind of a, it's kind of a quiet episode in a lot of ways. Um, I think there's some really good acting in it. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, the last episode was great. You know, with Annabella and and Jim and, and all Tremendous, that drama. Yeah. That drama. Was, yeah. That was an incredible episode. This is kind of uh, kind of somewhat predictable. Uh, Written by Lawrence Connor and David Chase, who collaborated on the Many Saints Many of Newark. Many Saints of Newark. Yes. Yeah. And directed yeah. by. The late John Patterson, who was one of the best guys I've ever worked with in this business. This is the seventh you know, of 13 that he directed. You know, Lawrence Connor's daughter is a big writer, producer. Uh, I think she collaborated with uh, Lena Dunham. On Girls, yeah. On Girls, and then they did another show together. Yeah, They did another show. Camping, I think it's called. And you did Girls, right? I played the professor uh, in the first season, a, a literature professor, poetry professor. You enjoyed that? I loved it. Yeah, it was fun. I liked. I worked with Lena. She was great. I really like. I I enjoyed it a lot. Um, you know, the title in this has a lot of kind of levels to it for the episode. Army of One was a slogan used by the military, right? By the by by the U.S. Army, a recruit a recruitment slogan for ads in the early around this time when the show was made in two thousand. One stands for officer non-commissioned officer and enlisted officer. Those are the three types of soldiers you have in the army. Uh, But it also, you know, for this episode, obviously you're talking about military school because, you know, they go to the military school for AJ. But it's also like a whole theme to me of everybody out for themselves in a way. You know, you have Jackie Jr. who it's kind of bleeding over from the prior episode who does this stupid crime for himself to rise up the ranks. And then he leaves his friend. He has a chance to save his friend. Oh yeah. And he leaves him, which David Chase quote, I quote, quote said about that act, Jackie Jr. Dumping his friend was the quint- quintessential soprano moment. Really? Meaning out for themselves, selfishness, cutthroat, backstabbing. Junior almost does the same thing towards the end of this episode at the funeral to you. Yeah. Ralphie, it's all about him. He's cutting Paulie out. He doesn't. He wants to just lowball him. You know, he's trying to usurp however he can. Paulie's just worried about his sit down at very in, inappropriate moments. Asking Tony wants his, He wants to put his mother in a, you know, a place that's out of his budget, basically. AJ stealing the tests. You know, uh, you know. There's and there's there's also a little bit of element with uh, Tony kind of at odds with all these people. Like he's at odds with Meadow. He's at odds with Carmelo over the school. He's at odds with uncle, you know, uncle junior and Ralphie and Paulie. So the title I think is an important one for this episode. I also think Tony is the, as selfish as any man anywhere. Tony, yeah. Tony Soprano. I think without so. a doubt. You know, I, I, I think so. All but right. for David to call that when Jackie Jr. doesn't pick up, his, you know, leaves his friend f- for dead. Yeah. The quintessential soprano moment. That's very telling. Absolutely. All right. We start out in the high school basement. Uh, AJ and Egon. Uh, uh, they, uh, Egon, which is a, I have a friend of mine. He's an Italian guy from Italy up in Toronto. He's been friends of mine for years. Uh, uh, he's a bartender at the Four Seasons. You know, great guy. His name's Egon. I find that an odd name for an Italian guy. Is he from the north? I'm not quite sure. I know the guy for years, you know. And, uh, the the and north we still of keep Italy in touch. is he's close a good man. to, you know, there's Switzerland and it's close to, to uh, Germany. So maybe there's, you know, the north might have names like that. Only I, I can't times, imagine a southern Italian with that name. That it's the only sense. two times I've uh, uh, heard that name. Uh, it's a famous painter, Egon Schiele. I never heard that. I yeah. don't know who that is. Uh, so uh, they got it. You know, they they're at the high school basement. They got a pee. Egon pees. 
Then AJ, they're waiting for the janitor to leave. They uh, break into the room and they grab a copy of the test. Now, did you ever do that stuff to, to pass a test or cheat to I steal did a test? You I never stole a test? Never, never, You never. never cheated on a test? Yeah, if I could look over to the other guy's thing, sure I did. Did you ever come in with crib notes? No, I was not that, uh, I was never that uh, uh, creative. But if I could see, like, especially a multiple choice, I would look over, especially, you know, in college or whatever. I'd, I'd take a peek. Taking a I, peek I, is one thing, but, like, really preparing with crib notes on your arm or I didn't a little do that. piece I of paper. Well, now it's much more sophisticated, I think. They have earpieces and, uh, you, you know. the kids. The yeah, students. the kids, the phones. It's a whole nother level now. It's easier to cheat. It's much easier. Well, I don't know if it's easier, but. They're very creative, you know, headsets and shit like that. But what did we have? You know, you try to put something in your pocket, you're taking a big chance. But I would certainly peek over. Then you got those kids that won't let you cheat off them. Yeah, you, know, you don't they, like those kids. No. I, was like, I wasn't on. one of those kids, no. If you wanted to look at my page, you're fine. I don't. Well, care. if you want to look at mine and... We could both be fuck ups, but well, I would. But some, you were a good, you were a college I was, graduate. I was a college graduate, but when I was young in high school, not so great. You I did didn't. became better later on. Yeah, I wasn't a great high school. I was good in junior high and good in college, but you know, you would grab a kid early and say, "Listen, man, you know, uh, you know this test. You got this shit down, and say, yeah, so you know, if you can, let me take a peek, huh?" Yeah. And he would say, "All right, go ahead," especially if you're next to him or behind him. You know, uh, you know, he would stretch, you know, one of those deals, you look back. Yeah, all right. That's good. <laughs> uh, the uh, apartment building, Jackie Jr. and little Bruce. Little Bruce. They go to Ray Ray, played by our friend Michael K. Williams, who's a tremendous actor. Yes. yes. One of my favorite actors. He's been in, a, he's done a lot of great work. Nominated for an Emmy for, for Bessie. He was in The Night Of. He was in The oh, Wire yeah. was his big. You know, uh, you know his big breakout, but Boardwalk Empire, he played uh, Chalky White. Chalky White, he was great. He's also works with the ACLU as an ambassador of, of Smart Justice. He, he um, does a lot of work with, you know, uh, social justice and stuff. He's uh, he gives back a lot, and he he's just a lovely guy too. I like. He's him also a, a big Nick fan. See I him see him at, at the, the garden games a too. lot. He, he's a he's a he great is actor a very a, nice guy. Yeah, he's right, and a. And a great actor, like you said. And he's he's in everything. I mean, he's getting his due. He's working, and I'm happy to see He him. works. He deserves you to know. work. He this is work one more. of his first roles. Was it? One of the first yeah. roles. Either the first or second role that he ever yeah. did, you know, on TV. Anyway, uh, Green Grove Nursing Home. Uh, Paulie uh, takes the tour with his mother. She's very – tears of joy. She can't believe he's such a good boy. She, Eight grand a month. Now – well, let's let's think about the math here. What he's going to have to earn to. What do you think? What do you think when we retire, me and you, go to a place like Green Grove, and we'll have like a double room with the door in between. We'll we'll be like Bert and Ernie, and we'll retire the, together. What do you think? We'll do a podcast from the nursing home. Why not? We don't even have to record it or broadcast it. No one will know. We'll just do it. What do you think? Me and you, we go to a place like Green Grove. The food is good. Everything's there. We sing. Everything is there. They show you movie night. You don't sing night. now. What sing? Well, they'll sing. We'll <laughs> listen. The movie night. It'll be fantastic. Let's it's, think about that. Let's think right. about that. Let's talk about it. Maybe we'll start a nursing home. Talking Sopranos <laughs> Elder Care, it's called. <laughs> well, we have the bedpans. Logos Put on the bedpans. face pans. on it. Yeah, yeah. that's good. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I, right inside of it, you lift the lid. Uh, tell me, what do you think? Do the math here. So that's almost a hundred. That's a hundred grand a year. Hey, listen, Paul, he's got no kids. He's got a he's got a girlfriend. He's not married. He lives in an apartment. He's got money coming every which way. Why would this be a problem? A hundred grand. Well, what do you think he makes in a year? Three hundred grand. He, I think he makes more than that. You're talking lots of money here. I know he kicks up. I, I don't know. You know, I think there's more money. Listen, Paulie is in his mid fifties. He's been a gangster probably thirty years at least. Oh, longer than 35 that. Thirty five years. Yeah. He's got money coming every which way. From Christopher alone on the sports book, six thousand a week. What's the problem? 
I don't know why well, he's not, He doesn't keep that. He kicks most of that. Uh, listen, unless Paulie has bad habits, and we haven't seen that, I don't know if he's a gambler. You know? Still uh, a big nut. That's, that's off the top before he spends anything on himself, which he probably doesn't spend much on himself. You can't say tax-free because it's all tax-free to them. It's all tax-free. Well, it's a... Uh, he loves his mother. That's Francis and some, how do you pronounce it? And some Plari. She passed away in 2017. Did a great job as Nucci, as, oh, yeah. as Paulie's mom. Yeah. Uh, a great relationship and a really good. Uh, and they're all around the piano. It's almost like a setup, though. You know, we're bringing in someone new and they're around the piano and they're dressed and they're, they're singing standards. And, uh, you know, it's such a great time. And maybe it is. <laughs> Parisian night is Fridays where they have. Coco Vaughn and she doesn't Blanquette want DeVoe. snails. No snails. She doesn't want snails. Do you I like, like French snails. food. You like snails? No, yeah. I like snails. My grandmother used to make snails in a big pot of sauce, red sauce, and then they would give us a safety pin, and you would dig it out like that. When I was a kid, with and pasta? I would, no, or just on its own. Just on its own. I mean, a big pot, and you could hear them. You know, you know, you could hear them like screaming when they drop them screaming. in there. Screaming. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you hear the, the, the snail that, noise. That might be the uh, steam coming out of the shells or something. And then you see them, some of them try to climb out of the pot, you know. And you, you have to, you got to keep the You're lid on the pot. You're getting me hungry, Steve. It sounds disgusting. I mean, Jesus it's fantastic. Christ. My grandmother made a red sauce with the snails that was out of this world. That's not for me. What I you would, know, I did used to like uh, uh, escargot the French way with butter, garlic butter. You don't like it anymore? The idea of eating them, no, something, something. I haven't had them in years. Something changed in the yeah, way, just I looking at it. I don't know. I have them in my backyard in California. There's a lot of them. So Paulie's uh, got to come up with a $40,000 deposit, deposit to get his mother in there. He's I don't see what's the problem. He's expecting that to come from this score with Ralphie. Uh, the Soprano Kitchen. Tony and Carmelo is sitting at the table. Uh, he mentions uh, the college kid. Uh, he died from crack. He was going to be a top draft choice, a la Lenny Bias. Do you remember Lenny that? Lenny Bias died of cocaine. Died but of now this guy, you know, Tony's, it's kind of a little bit like Livy. Livy used to read the paper and just talk about the most horrible, whatever the worst thing in the paper, he, she would bring it up. Is, but this is also Tony setting up. He knows what's to he's come. He's setting up Jackie he's Jr. setting all this up with Carmella. The table is set with Roe. Ralphie did it. Carmella. He was dealing hard drugs, and so when it happens, that's the story. So that and that story just covers it all because they know once you go down that route, yeah, you know it's bad. Yeah, There's it's no like it's it's like people that do drugs, right? And then they die of a heart attack. Whether it was from the drugs or not, people just go, "Ah, uh, he he brought it on himself." Exactly. Nothing there's we no, could have done. And she says, you tried with that boy, Tony. You tried hard with that kid. There's not a lot of compassion. They were at Dunkin' Donuts, Paulie, Silvio, and Ralphie. Uh, Silvio tells him, your, steps, your, your future steps are pissed on your leg. Uh, Ralphie doesn't like it. Oh, I'm going to give the guy uh, Mots. Uh, Mots, he's, he's losing face. They killed, uh, Jackie Jr. killed his car dealer. Shot two made guys. Um what do you think is fair in the split here? So there was a strong box. Paulie gave him the alarm codes. Ralphie got his crew to do it. They cut out little Paulie. I think 25,000 at least. That would have been fair? 25%. At least. At least. So you think, uh, so half Tony of. later on rules 12,000 for Paulie. And he's, I think Paulie he's got fucking a him beef. over. He's got a legit beef. So for the alarm codes, Telling him about the safe and what's in it, that's worth 25%. At, at least. least, at wow. least. You know, uh, maybe more. I mean, honestly, I, I think maybe he deserves the 50. And he certainly deserves a big number. I mean, without him, there's no score. He made it an easy gig. You got the codes. You don't have to, there's very, you know, lowers the risk immensely. And he says it's on his territory. Uh, he says, don't worry, he's going to get a Mots as soon as we can find him. Silvio says he's in a housing project in Bootin. They know where he is. Everybody yeah, knows. Ready, everybody knows. This is like, listen, uh, this northern Jersey is like Peyton Place here. Everybody knows everything. These small towns. So Connie, he should have really, Wayne, he should have rented Melbourne. a car or stole a car and just went to fucking who knows where. He made a big mistake. That's what I would have did. 
He's going to, to go you to get Nebraska. To have, you're gone. Just go. He had no money. I don't know who he could have got it from. He had no money, though. You know, so, you know, there, there, there's that. I don't know if he had any friends. It's kind of a prick, the kid. The people aren't also reaching out to help him. He's a prick. He's Spoiled a prick. prick. Vito calls Ralphie. I guess Pretty Ralphie funny. said, call me at this time so it looks like I'm – you know, I I did. I was in a meeting with a, somebody. It was a weird situation. Someone, somebody approached me and said they want you to do, uh, they want you to direct this something a project. So we got to go meet the guy who owns the rights to the project. And the guy who owns the rights to the project is a real douchebag. Like thinks he's much more important than he is. Now, the truth is, he's acting like. I'm the one who wants the job. I heard they were interested in me, so I'm going to talk to them. But his attitude is that, what? why do I think I deserve this job? Wow. So at some point, 10 minutes in, he gets a phone call and takes it. And I'm in the office with maybe four or five other people, two of his people, one, one, per, one or two people with me. And he gets on the call. So I leave the room. And uh, I'm on the phone. They come, someone comes back and gets me, and I walk in, and he was offended that I left the room. <laughs> I said, well, you were on the phone. He said, Is well, this was guy a real producer? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he yeah. said, well, it was an important call. I said, so was mine. <laughs> really? <laughs> it didn't work out. Let's put uh, it that way. Yeah, but, you know, I used to have a friend who would, he was cheating on his wife, and he would say, call me tonight. Say to who? You? Yeah. He would tell me in the daytime. It's before cell phones. I'm in my apartment. It's in the 80s. He would say, call me tonight at 7.15. 7.15. He was a little older than me. He was from Brooklyn. He had moved to Vegas. He was a crap dealer at the Dunes. And I would call him. I knew his wife. He was married. No kids. Call him at 7.15. I would, his wife would sometimes answer, hey, how you doing, Marianne? Michael there? Uh, yeah, hold on, Steve, how's everything? You know, small talk. And then he would get on the phone, what? No. You're kidding me. Are you out of your mind? I'll be right there. And this is how he got out of the house to go fuck well, around. How many times life. can you use that? Well, he would have different people do it. It was happening until he got divorced. But sometimes he, he would answer himself, what? Where? Where's the car cracked up? Are you okay? I like, wonder you know, if he if he made shit up about it. That's Steve. He's such a fuck sure. up again. He, you could bet on that. Yeah. This fucking kid won't leave me alone. I don't know what the fuck. Because I was younger. He was kind of right. uh, maybe four or five years older than me. And uh, that was his uh, thing. Uh, you know, so... Uh, and so Ralphie just is ducking him. Yeah, we're going to go, you know, we'll talk about this uh, He's also, time. And, and making them feel like shit. Make Ralphie. it fall. He says, I don't, he says on the phone, pretending to Tony, I'm not doing anything important. Ralphie is a prick. He's a prick, yeah. He is a prick. Yeah. He's a prick. Soprano bedroom, Tony's laying, lying in bed, phone rings, Jackie Jr. calls, I need your help, please. Tony don't want to know nothing. He's wiping his hands. He's done uh, with him. He's yeah. saying it's for my father. He said your father's been dead two years. He expired. He don't want to know nothing. There's an don't expiration no date. More. It's last week. Call your stepfather, he's saying. You know, and you see later in this episode, it seems like everyone's washed their hands. Absolutely. All right, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay. All right, we're back. Uh, so the little girl asked Jackie, uh, if he know uh, Ray Ray's daughter, uh, if he knows how to play chess, she says, my dad taught me, uh, Jackie's in the chair. He's sweating. He's crying. He's in trouble here, man. He's in trouble. And I think he knows it. He knows the it, the yeah. father, he played the father card. He went to Tony. Tony tried to help him too many times. Robbing Ralphie's card game was a really bad idea. Terrible just, idea. just the worst <laughs> He's really dumb, as they talk about at as the end of the episode. About later, yeah. He's really, really dumb. Uh, Vito drops the bag and and, bag with, and that has three hundred thousand dollars, a cash lot of money it's from the Esplanade deal. That's why he puts up with Ralphie. Exactly. That's why uh, they, Ralphie gets a wide berth, 
It's all about pa- money. It's passes all about money. left and right because he makes so much money. Way more. He's he's kicking up way more than Paulie Walnuts is. No, yeah. no doubt. Oh, for sure. But you know what? Uh, uh, you know, it reminds me a little. He, he, you know, Ralphie jumps in the car and he says, uh, "Yeah, you know, uh, you know, you got three hundred grand there." And Tony kind of like, "Yeah, thank you. You did good." Like pats him on the back, almost like Tony's a pimp. And the whore just gave you three hundred grand, and you did good. Like you did good, you know. And and a lot of these guys need that. Yeah, boss. Yeah, boss. Yeah, boss. You know. You know what I mean? It's I. It, I, I got that feeling there. Tony gives two fucks about him. Tony doesn't like him. We know that. But he gave him three hundred thousand dollars, and he gives Ralphie a little pat on the head. All right. You know. Uh, Fido earlier was funny when he had interrupted. Uh, uh, you know, when he called uh, Ralphie and he was going, uh, yeah, it's a squirrel, it's a possum, uh, it's a rabbit. That yeah. was pretty funny. He He's was in the car alone. He's just describing what he's seeing. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, you know, Furio collects the money, he drops it, and then, you know, he's told. Tony says, hey, let's get this done in a timely manner. Ralphie yeah, doesn't want to do give, this. He does. You, you were going to give him a pass. More important than that is that it happens timely. You're a captain. You don't want to create confusion and insubordination. Chain of command is important. He brings up these are all kind of military stuff, you know, illusions here. He's a captain. Um, yeah, Tony's manipulated him through this, basically saying he knew that he Ralphie's not going to want to live with the disrespect. That if he gives Jackie a pass, it's just going to make him look oh, yeah. fucking horrible. For well, a you long saw time. it already. You saw you a saw taste already. of it in the Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, the principal's office. AJ and Egon are in the principal's office. Uh, you know, he tells them, uh, you know, what do you want to tell me? You cooperate. If you, they always give you that. If you cooperate now, it'll be easier later. None That's of that bullshit. is true. Don't ever, don't ever dummy up. Listen, remember this, folks out there. Dummy up, dummy up, dummy up. Dummy up and get a lawyer. Don't ever <laughs> come forward. Don't if you ever tell come me forward. now, it's going to be a lot better for you. Don't ever better. come forward. What's you know? better for you is not to get, not to have anything happen. Get a lawyer. Shut up and get a lawyer. That's you the know best they both got ninety six, so they weren't even smart enough to do, you know that. But I don't expect them to. They both got after failing all their tests. Suddenly, the two of these guys get a ninety six. It's very obviously what happened. Uh, he knows they cheated. We'll call your parents. Tell them the good news. AJ's denying it. And his friend just breaks down once they hear the DNA stuff, you know. Right. Years ago, a friend of mine, uh, years ago, a friend of mine, they, they had these phony phone cards. Yeah. You know, remember the phone numbers, the long distance right, cards? Right, right, right. Everybody was using them. Everybody in the country was using them. And suddenly it comes down, if you turn yourself in. Where, where did it come down? Like, you know, well, they, you know, the word was out like, you know, in town that if you in the neighborhood in town, if you turn yourself in, you'll be forgiven. You, they won't press charges. Now they didn't even catch you yet. So guys were actually turning good. They got everybody's names. They know who it was, all this bullshit. And some friends of mine turned themselves in and they got in trouble and they kind of got, yeah, fined and you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, you know, when they got you, they got you. I mean, it's petty crime. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't turn yourself in. You know, yeah, I cheated. You know, it's not going to be any easier. Uh, FBI office uh, agent Harris Junior beat cancer. He's back. Judge is going to set a new trial. They're trying to get Tony, and then they bring up Christopher. Can we get through the nephew? They said they got Archie Banners by going through the the, the girlfriend. Who's Archie Banners? Have you heard that name before? No. no they no got idea. Archie Banners through the girlfriend, so they want to set up Christopher through his his fiance, his girlfriend. So uh, they they call for Deborah to come in here, please. She comes in. She's an FBI agent. She's Italian American. Uh, not on the field. He says, "How big could you make your hair?" Now, a little story here, which isn't that much of a secret, but Lola Glordini plays Danielle. Uh, Deborah Danielle, and originally it was shot with Feruza Balk, 
who is an actress that's done a ton of stuff. She was in Waterboy, and uh, that's one thing. I mean, she was in The Craft, Almost Famous, Return to Oz. She had a big role in The Waterboy. Waterboy Boy with, or Waterworld? Waterboy with Adam Sandler. Oh. Big role in that. And uh, she originally did three episodes, I believe, or maybe one. I, I heard she only did one. She did and, one, and but... only wanted to do one. She didn't want to commit to, like, a recurring role. She did one, and they wind up uh, recasting her with Lola Glaudini. And not only did they recast her on the show, they went back. And she's not on the DVD. There's no trace of Feruza Balk anyway. Wait, so they broadcast the episode with her? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yes. So... Oh, because this is the end of season three. So there they was a broadcast. long stretch. Between. So they broadcast the episode with Feruza Balk. She didn't, want to, she didn't want to commit to a recurring thing. She wanted to do a guest spot in one That's episode. Right. They re recast it, and now they want to go back. I get it. So they reshot it. Lola's done a lot of work. She was on Criminal Minds for a, a long time. Her father, Bob Glaudini, is a, a, a very well-known, respected playwright in New York off-Broadway scene. Uh, he did a play called Jacko's Boating that the Labyrinth Theater did with Seymour, uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. He made that into a movie. And, and, and Phil Hoffman directed the movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah with uh, Joe, Mantegna, uh, Joe Mantegna, I think, is in that. Uh, they, uh, Feruza Book, but you can see it on YouTube. You know, if you happen to DVR, if you happen to DVR the, that episode, you have it, but it's on YouTube. It's a clip of her... In the department store, uh, in you see Feruza Balk in that scene. In the department store, yeah. Yeah, 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 you see her. Uh, not in this scene, but I saw a clip of her uh, in that not scene. Not in this scene. Yeah. Which scene? Yeah. Uh, when, later on, when we get to the department store, you see. Oh, that her. scene, okay. Yeah. Uh, Ray Ray's apartment, uh, Jackie Jr. and Lena are playing chess. Ray Ray's watching. I think you're done for the way she's developing her nights. Uh, well, Jackie he is hits, done for. That's a yeah, metaphor, right? Exactly. He hits the board. He knocks a piece out. The little girl beats him, says he's going to go for a walk. Do they want anything? He said, no, we're okay. Jackie Jr. walks down the block. Vito, light on his feet, comes out of nowhere. <laughs> I don't know. I, it wasn't that light on his feet. Light on his feet, comes out of nowhere. Never sees it happen, and he... Uh, so he they knew him. where he was. They were Kill watching the house. Kills him in broad daylight. Waiting for him to come out. Kills him in broad daylight. And there you go. Jackie Jr. is no more. Ralph's office. Uh, he's talking to Rosalie on the phone. She says, "I $3,200 to get my transmission changed. He's pissed. Get it back from him. He said him. the transmission's compromised. He goes, I don't even know what that means. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, bring it to my guy, blah, blah, blah. When Vito comes in and gives the nod that he killed Jackie Jr., Ralphie knows there's going to be – now's not the time to worry about $3,200. Why is Ralphie packing – he says, I'm not going to be coming home. I got some shit to do. Because I don't think he wants to hear it. He doesn't want to hear her crying and wailing and – you know, he knows what's to come. He says it later on in the episode. He's no, a I know he says prick. it later, but that night. Well, he knows what's what's. Yeah, to come. he says the grief is. What does he say? Something like it's overbearing. It's 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 relentless or something. But he caused it, basically. Well, of course, these are <laughs> what are they? Psychopaths or sociopaths? Maybe a little of both. I don't both. know. And Tony is also right. Uh, by the bing back room, Paulie and Christopher, they're watching the Super Bowl pregame. They're taking bets. Tony arrives. A lot of action on the Super Bowl. Big, big, busy time for them always, every year. Tony kicks the refrigerator. He's looking for the low main. Well, Chris is still mad at him from last episode. So he walks About out. He Jackie says Jr. Quick hello. He feels like Tony's being shown preferential treatment to Jackie Jr. And he feels like it's bullshit and he's still pissed. And he... Uh, He's looking for, he says, I, I, he's been dreaming about that low main on the way over here. Uh, he kicks it. Paulie says, you're tight a little, you wound a little tight lately. And then he says, tells him about the 50000 he owes me. I've been telling you for months this guy's no good. I want to sit down. He says, I'll talk about, uh, I'll, uh, 
I'll take care of it. And what's Tony so wound up about? I guess a little bit about everything. Chris. Christopher's mad at him. They just killed his best friend's kid. AJ with school. But it's, it's, but that it's, didn't it's, happen yet. And, yeah. and I don't know if he knows that they killed Jackie yet. Well, he knows it's coming. So I, I, I oh, and the low main is gone. The most important thing. Let's not forget that. The uh, low yeah. main. Uh, so, so he's pre- really mad that that low main is gone. I think he really is. He was thinking about it. He gets there. It's not there. And he's probably thinking some asshole took it from him. Like some, you know. You know what I love? I, I love when he. You know, he wants, is there any more ganolis in the fridge? Is there any more crumb cake? Is there any more pie? Is there any more lo mein? He's always looking for something. It's very, it's very funny. It's a running gag throughout the whole series. That's true. Yeah. Uh, soprano House, Tony Carmilla, AJ are in the living room. This is, it comes down now, gets the call. Tony comes home, permanent expulsion. I prayed I would never see this. Maybe it was a blessing. The place was too loose. It's too easy. But they made good on their threat, the school, because they threatened last time. One and it more didn't thing. look like they were going to ma- ever make good on those threats. One more thing. It looked like they were just going to give him a benefit of the doubt forever, and they made good. They said, that's it. We're done. I don't care who you are, how much you're paying us, you're done. And uh, Tony, it just snaps, man. You know, I'm paying for all this. 6,000 square foot house, pool, Columbia. Everybody got scooters and bicycles. And, and uh, well, for what do I get for it? This is the, fun, this is the thanks I get. Which, is, goes, which is right, right? That's, absolutely. Yeah. I think I've said that speech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, AJ says, it sucks to be you. Uh, and I tell you what. He slaps him in the face, and that's a well-deserved slap. I would definitely agree. He also is smug and smirking, and he's really just... He's a nasty kid. He's not afraid of Tony in the least bit. It's amazing. The guys Tony really the, is at the end of his rope, though, here. He's had guy, enough. Guys really in the has. street with shaking their boots, and then AJ and Meadow, they don't give two shits who he is. Well, after uh, this moment, he kind of does because he realizes he's not, you know, he's, you can only push this guy so far, but he deserved that smack in the, head, in the face. Uh, he's going to military school. That's right. I got some brochures from Janice. She was going to send Harpo there. Uh, Carmela, I'm not sending away. Tony's livid, and we know what happened to Harpo. Harpo wound up homeless. Harpo's homeless. So I think maybe, there was a lot more at stake, though, than just. But the maybe if he did, if he would have went to military school, I don't think he was ever going to go to military school because <laughs> Janice was not going to pay for that. Tony uh, puts his foot down finally and just says, "That's enough." We've, you know what I mean? It's just like this is all bullshit, and he's right. They have the benefit, you know. They have every. I've given you everything. Every comfort, every luxury, every, you know, they don't want for anything, and yet you still just. You know, coming on the heels of the vandalism and this shit, too, you know. Absolutely. Soprano kitchen table. Carmella and AJ eat. They're looking at the brochures. I never said I was going. We're looking, and then you're going. You know, uh, Carmella says, we're just looking. You know, he says, yeah, we're looking, and then you're going. Uh, oh, uh, oh, my God. Uh, Marie, Carmella that's Vida, Rose's sister, sister I believe. She calls. Jackie Jr. was shot dead. Here's the phone call. The Booten Projects, drug dealers. Uh, Tony looks at AJ. You see, see what happens if you know you're a fuck up. And Tony knew it was coming. I mean, this is what they planned. This is it. Well, and the the irony here is obviously they're saying, like you said, they said he was involved in drugs. So so all bets are off when you go that route. But the reality is he was involved with Tony. You know, so Tony's world. Yeah, but you know, so I mean, could before once I understand once he shot Furio and killed Sunshine, I get that he had to go. But maybe Tony should have sent him away before this. Get when he the did the fuck. thing with Christopher go. and when he found heard he had a gun and go. all that, just get like out this. of here. I don't care where you go. Go to Florida. Go to California. Get out of New Jersey or New York. Get out of here. Go, you know, could that have happened? Whether and then, and then if the kid don't go, can, I, I don't know. Meadows dorm room, the phone rings. AJ not very couth. 
really isn't, this isn't the way this girl should find out about her ex-boyfriend and childhood friend got killed by some black dudes. They shot him. Uh, she drops the phone crying. Uh, a terrible phone call. Terrible phone call from Meadow. Murphy's office, 22 years old, living in a housing project. Shame to his family. This whole scene is very weird to me because he's basically, he's talking to Melfi to help with his, him deal with his emotions and his psychological makeup, but he's completely lying. Like he's almost telling yeah. her what she wants to hear, what he of thinks course. she wants to hear. Of well, course but he's lying. For what reason though? Why, why lie about this? I mean, he lies constantly in therapy. That's why it's not doing any good. He's a liar. He's a liar. You no, can't I mean, lie I can to see you lie. Can you? He's lying to, to, to protect illegal things he's doing and stuff like that, right? But here he's just saying, instead of saying, you know, I'm kind of fucked up. This kid started getting involved in my shit a little bit, and I, I wasn't able to protect him, and now he's dead. Instead, he's just blaming him. Like, he, it's a party line he's using with everyone. He was involved in drugs. Well, maybe he put it in his head. Maybe a socio-psychopath can do that. This is what really happened. Maybe he's convinced himself. I don't know. But and what's, then he the, says sh in the, in what's the, end, the shame in living in a housing project? Shame to his family. And what, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> it was also wasn't he wasn't living there. He was hiding. That's what he. And they, then they, she they, says, "You saw it coming." He says, "In the end, I failed him." Yeah. Uh, I, I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to make the same mistake with AJ. You know. So the the, the Jackie thing is tra You know, translating with AJ screwing up. And I'm not going to let that happen. But he knows AJ's not going to be. He even says it. AJ's not cut out for my business. That's never going to happen. Uh, you know, he's, I, I think he's more pissed off at AJ, not for being a fuck up, for being ungrateful. I'm sure. I'm sure it's all of that. I, I, I didn't have a choice. Meadows going to Columbia. If they've said it once, they've said it a thousand times about Meadow in Columbia. They wear this on their sleeve. Right. He wears it for different reasons. That this is how much money he's got to pay. Yeah, but so Carmela wears it on her sleeve. He wears West it on Amazon. as a status symbol. She yes. lives in New York City. Wow, and she goes to Columbia at Ivy League school. Uh, and Meadows very upset. He tells her, and uh, he would like Meadows. She mentioned that one time uh, to be a pediatrician. He would like that. That's what I he guess wants he to wants. Say. Melfi to say you're a good guy and you're doing a good job with your kids as opposed to these other parents. I think that's what it seems like he wants here. I'm sure he does. Does every parent want to hear that? Yeah, but he's not there for that reason. He's there because he has problems. He's, you know, it's like he's not getting to the root of his problem is that like this kid was involved in his business and that's why he and involved with his cohorts and that's why he's dead. Correct. But he doesn't want to see the truth. I don't. I think he's convinced himself that he's got nothing to do with this. Yeah, he yeah. passed it on to Ralphie, and that's what I think. Uh, Meadows in bed. Uh, I tell you what, Jamie Lynn, uh, she's always great, great in this episode. You see her becoming. She's not a kid anymore. You know, this was a very good episode for her. There's a lot she's of different a, colors and a lot of. She goes to a lot of different. Uh, and, and, and extreme places. It's really good work. Yes. Uh, Meadows in bed. Carmela uh, wakes her. Uh, Jackie's dead. You know, he's the first person my own age that I knew that ever died. He knew all the risks involved. What? X, half the kids I know, take it. She knows uh, what happened to him. She knows that it she wasn't knows. drugs. Yeah. She's just saying, look at who he grew up with, who his father was. Look at everybody we know. It's father was, was a narcissist. It, she's she's saying he's dead because he was involved in Tony Soprano's world, and Carmela's saying you're looking for. But Carmela's in denial, basically. I well, mean, he, if Meadow could see this so clearly, why yeah. can't Carmela? Carmela doesn't want to. That's right. Boogie men with Italian names. All right. Boogie men with Italian names. That's a great line. Uh, major uh, swing. Swingley. Swingley, played by Tobin Bell, who was Jigsaw in the Saw movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When he was on, uh, when I had the Spike show yeah. uh, with Beth, uh, Casino, Casino Cinema, Cinema, he yeah. was a guest. For the, when you had Saw and he was a guest? Yeah, I had Saw, one of the Saws, Saw 2, 3, 5, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And he was, he was a guest. He, he was great. And this guy's been in everything, man. It's more like what hasn't he been in? 
he, he's done a ton of work, uh, a real working actor. That's uh, not in the spotlight, really. You know what I mean? Just saw what solid, those are big movies, but huge. But over the years, just solid work. Yeah, always there, working steady. Uh, AJ's interviewing with Major Swingley. And he doesn't pull no punches. Uh, uh, you know, how's it feel to be a cheat? He asks AJ. You know, he's not screwing around. He tells him about the schedule. You got to get up at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, 5.30 in the morning, first call uh, formation. Then 6.20, you march to mess. 7 o'clock inspection. That's before school. Then at 8 o'clock, you start school. I mean, it's... No television. I got to tell you something. This sounds horrible to me. This to me sounds like going to jail. It sounds absolutely horrible. Well, there's a, there's an element to that. Yeah. I would be horrified if I was AJ. I'm not kidding you, because that's and the feeling I get. He's talking about uh, how we do things differently at your school. There's too much emphasis on what's good for you here. The higher good is the good of the core. This kind of reflects the title, of course, an army of one, as opposed to what's good for the core, what's good for everybody else. And like General um, MacArthur said, core, core, core. Was that Patton or MacArthur? I think he saw I think he said General MacArthur. He said this is a blueprint for total self discipline. Uh, yet he's smoking. He's a smoker. So <laughs> he also brings up all these AA slogans, stinking thinking, one day at a time, keep it simple. Oh, those are AA things. Stinking thinking, yeah. That's it's an not, AA that's thing? not one of their slogans, but you hear that in AA. You know, it's like you're blaming you know, stinking thinking is when you're blaming things for your life being so bad instead of taking responsibility, you know. So they're triggers for why people stay in addictive cycles, you know what I mean? Uh, AJ could be tells uh, Tony and Carmela, AJ could benefit from the discipline. Uh, Carmela's not down with the army, you know, amputees, war. What about creative uh, creativity, free thinking, uh, small classes? Uh, he tells them, we have small classes. And she's saying, what is this about a career in the military? And, uh, you know, Tony uh, is more open-minded when it comes to this. He wants to get AJ on the straight and arrow. Do you think military shit school works? Um, you know, it depends. Yeah, everybody's different. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's good, you know, to – Shake things up, I think, for some people. You know what they, I mean? They, they're not going to take any bullshit. They'll throw you out. They're not, you could only screw around there so much. I mean, they you can't know, lock I, you in. Um, no, but, it, you know, so listen, so everybody's different. Um, she brings up when they – Carmel and uh, Tony says the U.S. hardly goes to war anymore, yet – this aired in May of 2001, oh, and it would yeah. be later that year we did go to war. Also, we didn't mention this episode was the last time they used the World Trade Center in the opening credits because this aired oh. in May of 2001. It's the last episode of the season. The next season didn't come on the air till, the, till 2002. Wow. So we probably finished this up. Who knows? Winter of 2000. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, uh, Soprano bathroom, Tony and Carmella. This is a really bad fight. You know, it's you have a bad fights. Fight, you, know. you have fights. This is a bad one. Uh, you know, you want him to become a professional killer. He's supposed to be, he's still a child. He's supposed to be killing frogs and small animals. Uh, we tried to wear your way for 15 years. He's going to learn to be a man. Uh, she says, I will not send him to this place. No way he's going. He should be, he should be, he's a kid, should be killing frogs and small animals. Uh, he also mentioned something about, was that him that did something in the Cusimano yard? That, blowing up the frogs. Yeah, frogs and, and small animals. I, I think that's what she said. Maybe um, he thinks the world owes him a living, and she says, well, what could have given him that bizarre idea? Is she referring to uh, Tony? Tony? Of course. What, that Tony thinks the world owes him a living? Absolutely. Don't you think he does? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, certainly he works for it. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you know, there's also, when, you say, you know, when you're in an argument, you say things that doesn't all make sense. Yeah, he also says he thinks the world runs on his feelings. 
you know, and he and then he says, we've done it your way for 15 years with the Barry Brazelton. Barry Brazelton was a doctor who came up with this uh, behavioral assessment test. This is a test, all these questions and you the kid answers them and they, they say, well, he leans towards ADD or he leads towards, you know, antisocial behavior. He needs to learn how to be a man is basically what Tony said. Yeah, there's a lot of mumbo jumbo, don't you think? Sometimes things are what they are. You have a disrespectful kid, you have whatever. It, there's not always something that makes them that way, you know? Yeah. Some, some kids are just nice kids. It's like people are nice, some people aren't nice. That's it. End of the story. There's not always a root cause. It's not always because your father didn't say, you, I love you, and you become a prick for the next 60 years. And even if it is, you still got to deal with it. You know what I mean? That, that's just Jackie Jr.'s wake. Tony Carmella, Metal, the AJ, they walk in. Paulie's waiting. He jumps up. He's inappropriate. Uh, I, I, it's a wrong time to do that. It's all about him. And Tony's like, can I bury my best friend's kid? I haven't heard any, anything about the sit down. Uh, they say hello. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Meadow gets a glimpse of Jackie in the coffin. She breaks down. I mean, it's just horrible. Guys are in the back taking bets. They're booking. Now, let me ask you this. Rosalie says to Tony, look at this place. Two days before the Super Bowl, nobody shows up. What happened, Tony? Vegas moving the line. Is it, is it nobody showing up because, A, Jackie did a really bad thing to the family, shot, shot at maid guides, ki killed an associate? Or is it that Jackie's dead and nobody really feels the, uh, obligated to give respect to this family anymore? What is All it? of the above. All of the above. And also... They're busy they did, with the Super Bowl. They are busy with the Super Bowl. They're taking bets. Some of them went to the Super Bowl. They're taking action. And, you know, this is their business. They got no time to step in. These guys did, and they're, they're working right. while they're at the wake, which is more disrespectful to me right. than not going. Listen, if I, it was Tony's kid that got killed, they don't, it would be everybody would be there. I think it's all of the above. I mean, Jackie Sr. is gone. This kid is a prick. Uh, he did a really bad thing. Uh, no. You know, and I think it's all of that. She doesn't know that. She doesn't know. You she know. doesn't know he did a bad thing, right, to the family. Yeah, she doesn't know. Uh, of course, Crazy Janice comes in with a CD. She gives it to Mr. Cazzarelli, the owner of the funeral Christian Park. rock, Christian uh, contemporary music. Devotional music. It's a little bit ragged. Tommy Matola at Sony. It, it looks like he's going to offer us a deal. Right. Tommy Matola is all over this, uh, all over the Sopranos. He's, he, they mentioned him quite a few times. You know, he Tommy didn't give Matola? Janice a deal. I you never met him, no. I don't. Yeah. You? Yeah, 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 yeah. I sat with him at Howard Stern's wedding. Uh, he sat at the table. I think I told you. Rob Zombie, Tommy Matola, Dan Clores. Belzer and his wife, and me and my wife. That was our table. That's uh, a good table. And Tommy Matola is a, his wife is uh, Thalia. You know, she's a, a singer, fa very famous. And, well, he was uh, married to Mariah Carey, right? Is Mariah that Carey. Uh, Tommy, I think I know. Mar I met Mariah Carey. Uh, oh yeah, how was she? I was. Uh, there was. A, you, I don't know if it's still there. A restaurant in Chelsea called Luncheonette. I think, or well, cafeteria. Yeah. cafeteria, cafeteria on Seventh Avenue, like Nineteenth Street, and I yeah. was, well, I still had the bar a few blocks away, so the, we closed the bar. Maybe it was like two o'clock, and cafeteria was open twenty four hours. So I went in there at like three o'clock by myself, sat at the bar to eat something, and sitting in a booth is Mariah Carey with a bunch of her people, and somebody comes up and says, "Mariah wants you to join us for dinner." She was a fan, so I went over and had uh, and it was, late uh, she, supper. It was fun. Yeah. Great. She was three a.m. Three a.m. Yeah, it was about. She was with about four or five people. We had dinner and she, you know mm. picked up the tab, and it was very nice. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Matola, I think, grew up with Vinnie Pastore and Stormy. You know, Stormy. Yes, that's right. Stormy, and, Vinnie's, uh, Vinnie's buddy. Right, and right. Stormy used to work there. And uh, no, he's a very nice guy. Yeah, very nice guy. And, uh, they, he gets a lot of play here. Uh, the, outside the wake, Christopher pulls Tony into another room. Listen about Jackie and Ralph, how you handled it. 
so it won't, won't stick to any of us. I appreciate that you were looking out for me. Uh, anyway, what I said about not loving you, that's not how it is. It's a half-ass apology to me. He, no, he, I think it's an apology. It's but a It's a half-ass. He could have said, because he never comes out and says, I'm sorry. I was wrong. You were right. It's a half ass, and Tony's not receptive to it. Yeah, I guess you're right. Not that receptive. No, Tony's to absolutely not receptive. But, yeah, he should have said, I was wrong, you were right. And he leaves out the I was wrong part and basically says, you were right, you did the right thing. So it's Carmella a half ass Carmella stares apology. at Jackie in the coffin. She's standing over the coffin, which is just horrible. The open coffin, they should, abol- they should abolish that. It's horrible. It's, it's never just, a good thing. It's horrible. I remember when I was a kid, and I don't know why this is, if this is an old Italian thing. My friend's father died. I was about 14. And after the funeral, they went in there and they took pictures of the father in the coffin. Pictures of him. Mm. I don't know what that's about. Uh, it, it's horrifying to me. It's bad enough you got to go to a wake. When you have the open coffin that, that, that's ingrained in your head, this person you love, this person you care for, whether it be a friend, family member, mother or father, and it's in your head that way for many years. No, you can't it's still it gone. You know, it's like, why even, you know, why have that image? You can't it's get gone. it out of your head, man. I, I, I agree I, with you. I, 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 it's barbaric. And then uh, the old Italians, what old Italians? When I was a kid, three days of a wake, afternoon yeah. and night, and yeah. then the funeral, four fucking days. You know, why don't you just hang me right now, man? Yeah. You know? Mine is going to be so much better. But the vid- is the video going to be during the thing or after, a separate thing, the screening? It's not going to be a wake. It's going to be a party. With a screening. There'll be, there'll be no wake. There'll be no burial. It's going to be a party. And once everyone's there... Y'all, they'll have their drinks. They'll have their uh, mozzarella and provolone and roasted peppers. There's going to be the whole shebang. Oh, you got the menu already. All the things I love. All the things that I eat. Rice balls. Why the things you love? You're not going to be there. <laughs> Listen, these are for the people. I don't understand. These are for the – this is – an extension of me. This is my gift. Oh, 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 okay. So we'll think of you when we All eat that stuff. All the things that I like. Brujou, mozzarella, provolone. The nice so we could say, you know, like. Steve would have loved this prosciutto. Rice balls. All the things that I like will be served. But now, so and drinks, at this. Drinks will be served. And then at some point, right. and you'll coordinate, you'll say, Steve left us a message. And I want to introduce this video. Steve has a little something to say. But now the, the people that you mentioned in the video, will they be in the room? Possibly. I'm you going to want them at, there. I'm, of course. What good is it? Also, uh, it could play also. So that'll disarm them because they think they're invited. They're eating. You're whining and dining. And them, then even, I'm going to stick it gonna... right in their ass. Wow. And tell them what I think of them. Also, I'm thinking it could play out as an episode of Talking Sopranos. <laughs> I kind of like that. You do it alone, and then I'll pop on the screen. And it'll be worldwide. <gasps> worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> All right? Uh, but, like I said, that, that's assuming you're going to go before me, which we can't guarantee. Listen, if people want to take bets, you're in good shape. You do your uh, – what are you – I don't uh, know. What are I you mean, an I'm expert younger, in? but that don't mean anything anymore. What, what are you, a uh, taekwondo guy? Yes. You I'm don't eat taekwondo. meat. I, not that I eat a lot of meat, but you're much healthier. You eat healthier. I don't know about that. Yeah, healthier. That's, oh, but none of them, you know, at the end of the day – you know, well, Do you want to make a video and then I'll introduce yours? I don't know. I don't want to make. You want to motherfuck people? It's okay. No, I don't. By wanna, then I you're don't. gone. There's a lot of people that you have problems. By with. then I won't care. It stays I don't with care you. now. But you believe in the afterlife. No, I believe in reincarnation. It's different. All right. All right. You come back as a dog. You could if you come if, back if, as a dog. If you don't, if you don't do well in this life, you'll come back as an animal. If you do good in this life, you'll come back as a person. Oh, really? Yes. That's how it works. That's how it works. So if you're a real scumbag, what do you come back at? Like a rat? Maybe a even worse, an insect. Really? Maybe. I didn't know it worked oh, that yeah. way. So there's different levels. 
It depends on what you do, what you cultivate in this life. This is unbelievable to me. That's why it's important to be good So you now. can come back as an ant. Absolutely. And somebody will step on you one day walking down the block. Absolutely. Or a cockroach. Yes. There's a lot of fucking cockroaches out there now. There's way more insects than humans. It's harder yeah. to be a human. So all these people did something bad in their life. Yeah. A lot. A lot. So this is how it is. So this is what it's all about. The whole Buddhism thing. That's that's an aspect of it. You come it's back not what it's as all a, about. You come back if you are nasty to people now. You come back as possibly a cockroach later. An, an animal. You're cut. You're going down in the scale of things. But look, Willie is an animal. He lives with nice people who love him and take care of him. So he didn't do that bad. Right. You, if you come back as an animal that's abused, starving, then obviously you did something really wrong. Wow. Right? This is amazing to me. Uh, yeah, I so know it's... there's a lot of people are coming back as cockroaches and worse than that. I don't Absolutely. know what's worse. What's worse? Uh -huh. What's the lowest thing you could do? What's Charles Manson coming back as? Some something that's going to suffer. Yeah. What's Robert De Niro coming back at? A fucking, <laughs> like said, how about it, it, he comes back as a mole on somebody's fucking ass. Hey, look, life. there's animals that live better lives than some humans, no? Some sure. humans have it really hard and are just suffering and are, are being, whatever, tortured and imprisoned and horrible things, and some dogs live in the lap of luxury. So you could come back as a mole on a fucking dog's asshole. No, not as a mole. It's not a being. You have to come back as a sentient being, not a mole. Okay. Oh, I got a lot of questions. We're going to talk about You this have to morning. come back with something that has a consciousness, not, not a mole, not an inanimate object. So somebody came back as a dolphin that you want me to have a quiz against. Listen, dolphins are not fish. They're mammals, Steve. So somebody's coming back as a dolphin. It could be... Stephen Not Hawking. necessarily. Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait, Maybe wait. Stephen, look at it this Hawking, way too. Stephen Hawking's coming back as a, a dolphin, and then you want me to go up against Why him. would Stephen Hawking come lose. back as a dolphin? What did Maybe he, he do? he did something bad. Also, know. a dolphin might never have been a human, per se. Maybe it's always been in the animal realm being reincarnated. Who knows? Nobody knows these things. You know, the actual, well, you know, who did what or whatever. But the dolphin thing we need to look into. Dolphins are mammals. They're not fish. Okay. Remember that. This is fascinating. You, you, you just opened my eyes to something I had no idea. Oh, you're not going to do the video now. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> oh, fucking right I am. It's a, listen, it's in gear. I'm already working on it. I'm taking notes. I got a lot. I got about. Is it, is it going to be a Pod Jams production? I got to talk to Jeff Sussman. Hopefully, Jeff doesn't make it to the video. I, I love Jeff. Let's hope he doesn't make it to the video. He'll just EP it. Yeah. He'll just executive uh, produce it. But let me tell you something. I have a solid dozen people already. Solid dozen. Are, and they're all alive, all these people. They're all alive. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to talk about a dead person. A solid dozen. A solid dozen. A solid dozen motherfuckers that have done me wrong. Of all, they, you know, and they're... So it's a wide range, too, Michael. It's all walks of life. All walks of life. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, the way, uh, uh, now Carmella looks at the body, and then the next scene she says, let's do it your way, because uh, seeing Jackie dead makes her, you know, reassess her opinion about the military school. She has a whole change of scenery. And uh, you know what's funny? When they had the big argument, when Tony was trying to close the door and he kept slamming it, I don't think that was uh, in the script. I think he couldn't close the door and he just kept on fucking and he slamming went with it. it. Yeah. He's done that with the refrigerator numerous yeah. times, too. And he yeah. just went with it to yeah. make it more of a thing. Yeah. We're outside the food market. Silvio and Tony are at a table. Did you see in the background it said Janicelli Meats? That's Kevin who plays, who was on our crew, but also played the owner of the Ufa pizza. Ufa, and, and he's a good actor also. It looks like the meatpacking district, doesn't it? Here in New York City. That's what it reminded me of. Yeah, but I think it was Jersey, though. Jersey, no? yeah, but yeah. it just reminded me of that. Silvio Tony at the table. Paulie arrives. Uh, he's pissed off that he got there first before. Uh, and Ralphie did Ralphie, that on purpose. Oh, sure he did. Yeah. He's pissed off, and then uh, he gets there. You're late. Uh, yeah, well, tomorrow I'll be on time, and you'll still be stupid. 
Oh, that's a He's fucking. A prick. He don't but, care. Ralphie got giant, big elephant. Balls. Doesn't give a shit. But but with Green Grove, before Ralphie gets here, and Paulie says, you know, I, I'm putting him on Green Grove based on your recommendation, and Tony says, I never recommended it. That's right. And we had like, Jamar there, big, most expensive nursery home in the state, and Tony once again, it's a retirement community. But I think Tony's thinking. It's not a good idea. It's it's out of Paulie's league. He's he has a little bit of that vibe, it seems, and well, Paulie's picking know. up on it. I don't know if financially or Tony doesn't like that. Paulie, uh, you know, Tony's the kingpin. Right. He drives the Cadillac. He's you the can't king. drive a Cadillac. If you know, the boss is ago, driving it, you can't do what the boss does. You know, we talked about fights last weekend. Uh, when I worked at the hotel, the, the the there was a vice president there who saw me at the fight. I was ringside. I got a, a, you know, I knew them guys. They gave me a ticket. I was ringside. He saw me at the fight. He said to me at the fight, how'd you get these tickets? Because he was a fucking vice president and I was down here. I shouldn't have better seats than this motherfucker. Right, of course. That's All what's right? going on here. Also, bit. I had a Mercedes and uh, somebody told me, don't ever bring that to work. If your boss sees you in a nicer car than him, he's going to get jealous. And that's what this is. You, what do you mean? You're driving a Mercedes? Right. Even though you work hard, you bust your hole, you can't sit better. You can't have – what are you doing in this restaurant? I'm the boss. Don't yeah. you feel that way? You feel that way. So I remember once coming to a restaurant and you said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I come here all the time. <laughs> that was early on before you were a regular cast member. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, I tell you, Ralphie just don't give a fuck. You know, he, he's, a, he's a nasty guy. And, uh, you know, he just doesn't care. He doesn't care. And Paulie says, listen, you know, you screwed me out of this. Little Paulie was, you know, because Rafi says, we did all the work. You just gave me the codes. Big deal. Little And 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 Paulie says, little Paulie was ready to go, and you didn't come get him, basically to cut him out so he wouldn't have to acknowledge Paulie's help. Right? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 uh, no, no. They cut him out. Uh, listen, Tony already got to $300,000. He this doesn't is give a, a little- shit. This is a little reward for Ralphie. Only has to pay him twelve grand. Twelve out of grand. The 50. And Paulie says, "I can't believe this. He's betrayed." And Ralphie says, "Why not? Last year you believed flying saucers over East Rutherford. Now, uh, two thousand, there were flying saucers over East Rutherford, East Rutherford, New Jersey. There were sightings. And you believe that? No, there were. There were sightings. What do you mean? Do you, I believe it? People you believe that? Of, you believe that there was them. aliens in a flying saucer? Listen. UFO means, you know what it means? Unidentified flying object. Right. That doesn't mean it's an alien. It means it's a flying object that you can't identify. Most UFOs, listen, where I live in California, I'm near Vandenberg Air Force Base. I see weird shit flying all the time because they have experimental planes there. It's the Army. They're okay. experimenting so, with shit. So you're not saying it's an alien? No, but there have been... Roswell, New Mexico, in the, was that the I late forties? You believe in aliens? That was an alien. You know, I did a TV show called Project Blue Book. That's about what happened after Roswell. It's true stories. Now the government opened a whole division, Project Blue Book, to look into these aliens because Roswell were real aliens that landed. They even had an autopsy. Uh, there's a video of the I alien. I saw autopsy. that. I don't believe it. I don't believe. Oh no, in that's aliens. real. The alien I autopsy. don't believe in aliens. That's bullshit. That was from Roswell. I don't listen. They published a newspaper article. I don't the day believe after it. In, Ro in New Mexico, and it said the guy, they, they had pictures of the, the everything, and then the government came in and took everything away. And you think aliens are walking on the face of the earth right now? I don't. Some people do. Some people think there's reptilians. I don't believe in um, UFOs. I've heard the stories. I personally. What do you mean you don't believe in UFOs? You I, don't believe there's unidentified flying yeah, objects? Yeah, well, that. It could be a Frisbee. I mean, there's an explanation. I don't believe there's flying saucers. You don't believe in aliens? No, I don't believe in aliens. But Roswell was real, though, Steve. That's I, been documented. I saw that video. That's not a real alien. That's it. 
There's a funny line in the show Dice. I did one episode of that show with Andrew Dice Clay called Dice, and in the same episode, Mickey Rourke's in it. And uh, I guess Mick, Mickey Rourke, uh, Dice says, I don't believe in Viagra. And Mickey Rourke says, uh, it's not a UFO. It's a pill that makes your dick hard. <laughs> there you go. It was a very funny line. Perfect. Uh, here we are at the clothing store. Adriana's shopping for a dress for the funeral. Deborah, Danielle walks up. Uh, you know, she strikes up a conversation. Uh Puts on a heavy, thick New York accent. Uh, they start talking. I'm going to go to a Starbucks. They seem to click. Yeah, they, st- you know, I got to be honest. It, I'll be honest, the scene, it did not seem like enough clicking for her to say, yeah, let's just perfect stranger walks up and makes a comment about shoes and now you're going to go have coffee with them. You know, Adrienne is not the smartest. I think she's kind of, even though she's in this world, she's kind of an innocent. I think she's naive to a certain degree. She's not the brightest girl. She, no, I'm not talking about her intelligence. I'm talking about her willingness to go have coffee with a stranger who said three sentences to her. You know, I mean, I wouldn't do it. You know, no, I, mean, I, mean, I wouldn't do it. I would go, what the fuck is this? But, you know, she's got the big hair, kind of looks good looking, kind of looks like Adriana's very dresses the way she dresses, kind of similar. You know, maybe she thinks, hey, you know, she doesn't have any friends. Adriana, she have that friends, we've seen. No. That's maybe part of it. She doesn't have friends. Uh, Christopher won't allow her to have friends. Well, this is the beginning of... A slippery slope. Yeah. Sopranos, the living room. Tony watches uh, Dr. Freed's erectile dysfunction commercial. <laughs> it's funny, no matter what, he was happy. Hey, I know this guy. I know this guy. <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, when you know someone on TV, <laughs> no matter what, right? No matter what they're doing. And then he says, to imagine needing this kind of surgery. And then he wishes he didn't say that. Yeah, that was a little weird. Yeah, a little uh, awkwardness. Yeah, there. it was very funny. Uh, AJ comes down. Hey, it's Sergeant Bilko, which was an old sitcom with Phil Silvers. Phil Silvers was funny, wasn't he? Yeah, that was a very funny show. What and else they, was Phil Silvers on? They besides? did a, they did a uh, I think it's also a movie uh, yeah. they made later on, Sergeant Bilko. But very didn't he funny. do another show too? McHale's Navy. McHale's Navy, yeah. Uh, and that also was a movie. Uh, he says, I look like a total jerk off. I don't want to go. You need toughening up. Uh, he won't put the hat on. I got to be honest. When he puts the hat on, he looks like a fucking toy soldier from, uh, you know. Absolutely. From uh, FAO Schwartz. Yeah. It's... He does kind of look like a jerk off. Oh, I'll yeah. be honest. Uh, he curses at his mother, which is very bad. Tony gets in his face. Uh, this is bad. It's sad. He don't want to go. You know, he don't want to go. Uh, he has Murphy a panic attack. He falls down. We've seen it before, but Tony hasn't. When did we oh, see it? I don't remember. We saw it at football practice. Oh, that's right. And, he had and, a panic attack, and they never told. And now he parents. brings this up in therapy. Correct. But when did he find out that... Oh, he's just making the connection. Oh, that must have been a panic attack when he passed out at football practice and it wasn't dehydration. Correct. And now he wants to sue them. She Uh, says, if you're right, uh, now he can't go to military school. So AJ caught a break. He caught a break. Tony Brames is soprano gene. He says, my great grandfather drove off, uh, drove a mule off a mountain road. Great, great, great grandfather. Great, 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 great grandfather. And and Melfi says something interesting, which I liked a lot. You blame your genes. Blaming your genes is really blaming yourself. Yeah. And uh, which is cool. I like the, that she said that and kind of called him on that. Um, how are we going to save this kid? That's what he says at the end of the scene here. You know, I don't think Tony's a bad father, but they know what's going on. They're spoiled. He doesn't spend a ton of time at home, Tony. You know? Not a ton, but not he's not an absent father by any means. No, means. no, no. But but uh, they must have also, uh, you know, uh, yeah, come on. They must know. Here, them arguing about the gumada and stuff. I mean, come on. They know everything. Yeah, the kids know. You know what I mean? 
I mean, he's uh, him and Carmelo banging each other. The kids are in the house, and it's not that late at night. I mean, they they you know come on. Banging, you mean fights or you mean sex? Sex. Oh, sex. Yeah, yeah and they... fights and fights. You know, they 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 they're not kids. They're not babies anymore. No, they know what's going not. on. Uh, Cemetery. My favorite character. One of my favorite characters. Two to five, seven to nine is at the is cemetery. in the cemetery. Two to five, Which is one of the nine. great names in television history. Absolutely, character. and and once again, I'll reiterate. Uh, that is the time of wakes. At the Two to five. Home, yeah. uh, they take a break to go eat and drink, and then seven to nine. People who she, work all day can't go in the afternoon. They come at night. You got to go night. if you're family. You got to be there the whole time to see people and and fucking torture yourself. Torture uh, yourself. Uh, the county sheriff. Now this is not the FBI. Yeah, these are not federal crimes. They're arresting them for gambling. They do this every year during Super Bowl season. When there's a lot of money, basically they probably get paid off. That's what probably happens, right? Exactly, and they do this for publicity, like uh, Sylvia Pop says. Corn headlines. This time I was out. Uh, I was out because before my soup got cold. And you see this, you, you you know, you'll see it probably the next Super Bowl. They always make a big bookmaking bust, you know, uh, always. But now that it's, it's legal, sports betting's it's legal, legal in, in so New many Jersey. places. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at the Meadowlands and, and obviously in, in Las Vegas. So it's not like it used to be, you know. Yeah. Uh, Silvio Manfred Dante. His middle name is Manfred, yeah, which yeah, I find so uh, I, I caught that. Paulie uh, runs. He's running. From the cops. good he's shape, running Tony, fast. Then. Yeah. He's running fast. Bacalon Jr. show up late. They see the feds, and Jr. gets in the car and is ready to leave you in the lurch. Yes. Yes, he is. Uh, Roa screams. Horrible, horrible, horrible scream. Meadow breaks down. It is a very sad, terrible scene. The priest is played by Dick Latessa. Now, isn't he? A, he was a big Broadway guy, Dick Latessa. Broadway actor, yeah. Big Broadway. He was good friends with Dominic. Him uh, and Dominic okay. and Aze were, were, were close friends that, that I know. Uh, Rosalie's Kitchen. Family arrives. Food, drink everywhere. Uh, Ralphie's watching TV. He could give two shits. It's on the yes. phone. He's watching TV. Uh, and then Meadow gets into a big conversation with uh, uh, Kelly. Kel but Kelly basically presents Meadow's point of view in this, the scene she had with Carmela, basically saying she knows he was not killed because he was in, you know, with, with drug dealers in, in the projects. She knows that he was killed because he's involved in organized crime and that they kill each other. He was killed by some fat fuck wearing see-through socks. And now Meadow takes the opposite point of view. Yeah. Basically she's saying, you know, that uh, Meadow's in denial. You have no basis to say that. And how do you do this in front of an outsider? It's her cousin she's talking about. Right. Where's the loyalty? Right. Now Meadow's at talking about loyalty. And, you know, I guess push comes to shove. She's her father's daughter and she, you know, she knows he's, he's got his problems, but she loves him and she knows that she's, you know, in some ways she's growing up here, basically yeah. saying, yeah. you know, absolutely. And, and, and it's about loyalty to her. She says, Jesus Christ, some loyalty to Kelly. In some ways she's realizing that, you know, she loves her dad. He's done what he can. He's with, he has his faults. He has his, you know, but uh, it's how she's grown up. And she, she, she takes. She pours her herself a, a, a huge glass Gigantic of vodka. vodka. Gigantic. No ice. I mean, unless it came out of the refrigerator, but a big glass of vodka. I guess that's to set up this, the next scene in the restaurant. I used to goggle with that kind of vodka that, that that was even not even getting started, right? <laughs> that was well. We used to start drinking before I started drinking. We all did, right? Before now, Australia, we went out, you didn't like that in Australia. They get very small pours in terrible. Australia. I loved it, everything about a, Australia except for their uh, serving purposes. Remember that? Every that's a country wide. Well, wherever we were, it's legal thing. They could only give a small. What is it? One ounce. Something. If you buy a drink. We had our own vodka backstage. I poured a glass kind of like that, but on the rocks. And 
I, what did I do? I came out. I said, this would cost $85 here. <laughs> In Australia. Maybe low, maybe more. It's unbelievable. Uh, Vesuvio's Vesuvio, restaurant. You notice Junior says he's having the full dinner, meaning what? Usually they do a buffet at things like that. Is that what he's saying? He, he referring to Artie. Is yeah. that what he's saying? Having the full dinner, the sauce is good today. The gravy, he calls Gravy's it. Gravy's good today. Uh, yeah, I call it sauce. That whole sauce gravy thing, I hate that argument, but I've never – my grandmother called it gravy. I, I'm a sauce Gravy, guy. I think, was uh, – well, because, I don't know, Bronx thing? That's that's what they said where I, my family was, Bronx. So gravy. My grandmother gravy. did in Brooklyn, but we always called it sauce and still do. But uh, he says uh, the gravy's good today. He says uh, the kid was always a dumb fuck, though, wasn't he? Did he almost drown in three inches of water? Uh, the penguin exhibit. The, the, that is a classic, that classic, is. classic, and only Uncle Junior could deliver that line. And and Junior Dominic is, Kianese. And Junior is just great on top of his game in this scene, Dominic. Uh, the, I, see that it's it's not even so much what he's saying; it's also the attitude, which which you know, with what how he says it, the attitude he uses to say it. Well, he's got this old old. Old school wisdom. He's the elder of this whole group. He doesn't give a fuck. He's he selfish as all fuck. And, but he's very, he's no dummy. No, he's no, not he's a dummy. No dummy. Uh, he knows this world anyway. Uh, he says in the old days, if a Jackie Sr. was alive, it would be flower cars up and down the block, no matter what the boy had done. Um, so it's part of it's that Jackie's dead and the people don't pay the same respect. Uh, the Rico trial's coming up. Uh, you know, fucking illness changed my whole viewpoint. I'm going to stop and smell the roses. Uh, they talk about a flight risk. I've been farting, another classic line, farting into the same sofa cushion for the last 18 months. Really good and, scene. And then he says, I'm going to, uh, you know, my uh, uh, the illness has changed my whole viewpoint. I'm going to stop and smell the roses, which he's not going to do. No. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> and Tony says, we all should. What the fuck? Yeah. We, and he's not going to either. No. Uh, they continue on. Paulie, uh, well, then Paulie walks to his car. Uh, Johnny Sack is waiting for him. Uh, you know, that Paulie, Paulie got a big mouth. Well, but Paulie got a big mouth, a but big also mouth. Johnny knows what went down. Yeah, because Paulie says you didn't hear. I got you know Tony ruled against me, and and Johnny says I don't stick my beak in. That's all he does is stick his beak in. Yeah. He sticks his beak in all the time. That's and he's his also whole lying purpose. about Carmine asked for you. That's a lie. That's a lie. I think maybe part of you know part of the move to Jersey maybe was to kind of get closer and get more control over I this business so. here. That's. I think uh, so. He knows what happened. He knows that Tony ruled against him. He hears through the grapevine. He probably heard from Ralphie because he's close to Ralphie. So Ralphie might have bragged and said, and eh, even Tony ruled against Paul. He gave me 12. Yeah, I had to give him 12 grand. Paul, he wanted 50. So now Johnny's making a move. That's a move, this whole scene. And he says, Tony doesn't, uh, I'm getting feeling Tony doesn't respect the elderly. You know, because how he treated his he mother. He said that to Junior. Paulie well, says, I told you, I said to Junior, Tony doesn't respect the elderly. Yeah. And Johnny says, what are you making? Maness? Maness means like soup. Yeah. He says, you're, you're stirring the pot. That's what that means. But Johnny's stirring the pot. Johnny is a, uh, is a troublemaker. And like you said, all he does is stick his beak in. Yeah. Don't confuse money with caring. Look how he treated his mother. He refers yeah. to Tony that way. It's all about... Carmine's not high on Tony and Ralph, their generation, basically saying, you know, uh, which probably is not true either. No, it's a, it's all a lie. Uh, uh, Johnny is jockeying also to take over from Carmine someday, obviously. He's the underboss. And have power in New Jersey. And to Correct. Have, yeah. Uh, Carmella's car, uh, Carmella Metal, they're driving to Vesuvio. Look how people deal with each other, even families like Jackie's family. They were never there for him. They let him do whatever he wanted. Uh, they said uh, Jackie Sr. was a narcissist. 
Uh, Rose, Rose, she says Roe is kind of like checked out and Jack yeah. and Jackie Sr. is a narcissist. They let him do whatever he wanted. She's kind of appreciating her parents a bit. She says in the beginning, you know, didn't you say max out the good times with those you love? And, and, and Carmel says that was actually your father who said that. Meadow is kind of appreciating who her parents were as opposed to who Jackie's parents were to him. But and she's she been turns. drinking. She's been then drinking. Then she turns and Carmela says, well, I'm glad you see. And Meadow don't like that. And she says, yeah, right. That's an excuse for you to be intrusive and controlling. She's really sharp, Meadow. Hey, she goes to Columbia, as they said a thousand times. A thousand uh, times. Vesuvio, Ralph holds court. He's telling a joke. Janice. You know what that joke is, right? No. It's, I don't know the full joke, but he's saying that Rabbi says to the bearded, yeah, basically somebody, somebody's a miracle worker and he's healing people. And the rabbi says, don't touch me. I'm on total disability. He doesn't want to be healed. So he can keep collecting his disability. But Janice sits on Ralphie's so lap. It's, a, Janice, it's, who it's is, a Jew joke. I guess it is. And, but Janice <laughs> is on disability. And she sits on, on Ralphie's lap and, and is she laughing loves at it. And she's touching him and Janice is making a move. It's very obvious. She's been single not, for a little. Not an appropriate place to make a move. No, but the she's. Role of a, you know, his it's Janice. It's Janice. Uh, Christopher, Silvio, and Patsy arrive. Again, got, that's another example of the selfishness we were talking about in the beginning. You know, it's like, it's her boy, you know. Ralphie's girlfriend's son's funeral, funeral, and Janice doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. Uh, they arrived. They got, uh, obviously, they had gotten arrested. They're out on bail quickly, very quickly. Uh, Junior starts singing. Everyone's cheering him on. Junior stands up. I beat cancer. Now I'm going to beat the can. Uh, it's a sentimental song. It means ungrateful heart. Uh, Corey, you don't think about my pain. That's one of the lines in the song. Uh, he's singing. Uh, which Dominic loves to sing, as we know. He sings professionally. Yeah. Uh, were you at Were you at Dominic's bachelor party? No. At Il Cortile. No. Dominic had a bachelor party, and uh, the last time he got married, and I said the last time he's been married a few times, right? Numerous times, and this is probably his last time being married to Jane, and it was all guys, and I said to him ahead of time. Dominic, what do you want? You want, you know, want us to get some girls, strippers? What do you want at the bachelor party? Because a lot of the cast came, a lot of the guys. We had to be 25 of us, at least, 30 of us. Maybe you were out of town. And everyone was there. And uh, he said, just get some, you know, he wanted to sing. So we got some Italian musicians, and he sang all night, and we drank and ate, and it was just fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, we gave I love toast. Dominic. Absolutely. How could you not? And and he loves to sing, and he's been singing in nursing homes for years and years. He entertains uh, people for years in nursing homes, and he, he does. Loves but he also does like uh, clubs and and oh, yeah, nightclubs and bars. He I, does I his opened own show. for him in Vegas. I opened for him in yeah. Vegas. Uh, we played. What did you Suns. do? I kind of did nothing. They, they insisted on me <laughs> being there. I I kind of told some stories and kind of did some half ass. I had a piece of paper and I kind of, you know, had some funny jokes. Someone some wrote jokes. for me, like, like a, a list, you know, is it a, is it B? You know, I did 10 minutes. Then Dominic made me sing for Nikki Lee for Nikki Law with him. Where was it? And we kind of did a Bobby and junior routine. It was kind of like that. So at the sunset station, two shows, we sold out 400 seats each. I think we did it two shows one night or two shows two nights. And we nice. signed autograph. It was a lot of fun. It was years ago, many years ago. A lot of fun. It was just Dominic with his guitar. Uh, and That's I don't know great. what the fuck. I had no business being there, but they insisted. <laughs> I emceed. You emceed. So, in other words, you said, what do you do? Like, I have no talent. Well, you said you opened them. Well, what seven, the fuck uh, did I do? What did I do? I fucking ballet dance. Uh, that's what, what I'm asking. That's that's why I asked you. I mean, you didn't sing. You're not a comedian. No, I'm not. I, <laughs> so I'm really nothing. I'm here by accident. So uh, Junior starts singing. Uh, it is uh, the song uh, "Koi Ingrato." Koi Ingrato, Ingrateful Heart. Everybody's I'm getting very emotional. 
very, very, very emotional. Uh, they're very, uh, you know, Bobby's crying like a baby. Johnny Sack is crying like a baby. Meadow's throwing, very, Meadow's very drunk. She's throwing uh, bread at him. Kind of uh, like Jim at the at Jim Sag at the Sag Awards. But, but uh, uh, she's very drunk. She just, she knocks down a Cosmo. She grabs a glass of wine. She's getting out of control. Uh, I think Charmaine and Artie are there. Everyone's there. It pans. You know, we shot this, and the reason I remember it, I had come in the night before on the red eye. We shot it at the stage, right, Silicon? At the stage. I came in the night before on the red eye. I got in about 6 o'clock. I slept a couple hours in the dressing room. And this was the last day of the season when we shot this. And there's a guy in the scene. He's a heavy set guy. Jim Scabelli, his name is. And he, he was a friend of mine. And I, I, I met him. He paid uh, in a charity. He paid for to have lunch with me and Dominic at the Friars Club. And he was a really nice guy. He had Yankee tickets. And uh, we became friends. And he was the biggest Soprano fan uh, and I got him to be uh, an extra. He passed away young at 54 years old. But he was That's an extra. That's my age, 54. He was an extra in this scene, a really nice guy, donated to a lot of charities, nice family. And you see him, uh, and he's there. And, I mean, he told me he had gotten hundreds, literally hundreds of calls from people. Uh, people you know, he saw just ha He happened to be an extra on that day. Uh, and you saw him. I mean, you said they pan a couple times. You see him in the scene. Jim Scabelli, and that's how I met him. He had, for a charity event, and, uh, uh, and I was happy that we could do that for him. You know, uh, Tony chases her outside, chases uh, uh, Meadow, gets up and runs, chases her outside. She almost get hit by a car. I love how she said when – Tony approaches and she goes, yeah, yeah, I'm going. She was great in that moment, yeah, the way she's she, drunk and just like, it was very funny. She's and really it's good. a really good scene. It was a really good way to end the season. Well, but we really weird. The end here was very, one of the weirdest endings because he's singing. Cordon Grato is an Italian song. And then it fades into a French yeah. song. Parlez moi d'amour, speak to me of love or speak to me my With love. With a woman's voice. Then it, it it fades into a Spanish song or no, a Chinese song, then a Spanish song. And, you know, I haven't seen this episode since it aired probably. And I, when I watched it last night, I was like, what is that? You know, you'd think it would just fade out on Junior, right? Why this weird edit into three other songs? So I looked it up. I saw an interview that David gave, uh, and he said basically he was making a statement about pop music. Pop music being engaged in sentimentality all over the world. It's a manipulation. He says, Junior, his Junior, the most selfish character probably on the show, pouring out his heart, and none of it meant a thing. He's wallowing in this big sentimental moment, uh, as is everyone else in the room. And none of it means a thing. It's pop music has been so abused and overused, manipul uh, manipulated and employed in service to the devil, David said. Meaning, you're manipulated to sell records and make money. Giving the, and he wanted to give the audience a laugh about how the audience themselves are manipulated in life by sentimental pop music. That was the statement that was so specific to do these edits into three other songs besides Korngrat. So all, he's using different languages to represent all over the world. We all are manipulated by sentimentality through pop music. It's basically saying this whole thing and everyone crying and Dominic being all full of passion is all really insincere and bullshit. It's all bullshit, brother. All okay, right. it is time for the Talking Sopranos Ask Me Anything seg segment. The winner of our AMA Best Question of the Week is Ed. Do you know where Ed is from, Steve? I have no from idea. Hell, Michigan. Oh, wow. Do you know there's a place called Hell, Michigan? Hell, Michigan. H-E-L-L. -L. I wonder if it's like hell. 
We're sending Ed a pair of Bose headphones. What is hell? Tell me what hell is again. Hell is an Irish bar on St. Patrick's Day for eternity. And all you eat is corned beef and cabbage. And every day is St. Patrick's Day. Every day, and they play when Irish eyes are smiling. Well, that's a quote from the show, so people don't get annoyed. That's a quote from the show. I'm not Irish phobic or anti Irish. That was. I'm pro Irish. I'm pro Irish. Me too. Hi, guys. Um, I love the podcast. I think this is my fourth time asking quest- uh, questions, but with the insight you bring to each episode, it's like seeing it with new eyes. Oh, it's his fourth time watching the show. My question's about Uncle Junior, which is good because you're an expert on Uncle Junior. How come he never had a family? As macho as these guys are, it seems that a family is a symbol of masculinity. Being a lifelong bachelor, I think, would be looked on as suspect, that he may be a fanook, as they say. Can you shed any light on Junior or this backstory? Thank you, Ed. Hey, Ed, why don't you go to hell, you fuck? I I knew you were going to say that. Come on, I'm predictable. What am I? I'm predictable. I knew you were going to say that. I'm sure Ed hears that a lot, too. Yeah, I'm sure he does. Well, then he should move out of hell if he doesn't like it. Or run for mayor of hell. Yeah. You then know. you're running hell. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have cold days in hell, Michigan? Yeah, well, I'm sure he's heard all the jokes, but hey. He's heard all the jokes. So answer to, uh, what, what's your opinion of the, his question? What's your? Well, I think, uh, listen, uh, I mean, he's a confirmed bachelor. He probably, he's a, probably been grumpy even when he was younger. We know he's had girlfriends. Bitter, jealous, kind of was always jealous of Johnny Boy, I think. I don't think he's got patience to raise a kid. He raised Tony, or he was a good uncle to Tony, took him to ball games. But that's not raising. That's a whole different deal. Is he only there for the good times? Uh, He's very extremely selfish and self-absorbed. There's a lot of people uh, that have never been married that aren't gay. I mean, that's... uh, you know, no, we know he's, he, he likes women. I mean, he likes them to an extreme that puts him on the outs with his fellow mobsters. He, we, you know, he likes to have oral sex with women. But I think I that I, he, I, he would have been a terrible father and exactly. a terrible husband. And I think too, he knows that. He knows that. It's, but he's better off not being a father or a husband. And he also doesn't want to be bothered. He's, he wants to watch his soap operas. And he's probably been this for years. It, Forever. Not just because he's an old man. He wants to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He had a lot of money, maybe. I think we up. all do, but some of us don't get to. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> do what uh, we want when we want to do it. I think that's what it is. Now he's a crotchety old man. I don't think he has any patience. He could certainly never have a woman around now. Uh, you know, he cares, yeah, he's old. He cares only about himself. If you're in a relationship or you're married, it's got to be give and take, right? It can't be one way, one way, one way. And when it is, the marriage ends usually. The marriage ends, yeah. Uh, you know, he's your favorite character, one of my favorite characters. Well, Paulie Walnuts is a bachelor, correct? Never was married, never had a family. Same, probably to go on the same path of, of Junior. Doesn't want also to be tied down. Also, very self-absorbed. I mean, he's a loyal soldier in the family, but he's a, in terms of his personal life, he doesn't. He wouldn't be a good father. I and girlfriends, he's had, We've seen him. He's got. He's gumadas. got his, he's got his But let he's, me ask you this: If you're not married and you have a girlfriend, is that is it considered a gumar? No, I would say no. So he doesn't have gumas, he has girlfriends. Yeah, but some guys use, use the gumana term as a girlfriend. But gumana really means mistress. That's what I think, you know. Right. Uh, uh, also, what, what's a, a, a little strange to me, uh, you know, like when you have a grown man who never left his house and lives with his mother, I find that a little odd. I know, I know as they get older, you're taking care of your mother, you know, you get older, you're taking but care of them. some people never, ever leave. And they go never leave. They, there was always guys in my neighborhood. They lived with their mother forever. It was like, hmm, what's up with that there? You know, I mean, at least go get your own place. All right, you don't want to get married. You don't want a, a wife. You don't want a girlfriend. Well, you know, go get your own fucking apartment. You know what I mean? 
Mother's still cooking for you, still cleaning for you, still well, doing your laundry. Well, that was Walnuts, right? He, did he, does he live with his mother? I, well, he did, not now, no. In the show? Yeah, I'm talking about the show. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's All right. confusing. Ed, thank you. Ed, from hell, take care of yourself. Ed, from hell, we love you. Thank you. There you go. Enjoy your uh, Bose headphones. All right, man. Uh, I enjoyed that. I know the episode. Uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed this episode. I like the end. Uh, it's a good ending. I enjoyed this episode tremendously. I got to tell you, I am enjoying these episodes so much. I haven't seen them yeah, in such me a too. long time. That's great. Uh, it see. is so. If you have any doubt of the brilliance of David Chase and the writers and everyone else, uh, yeah. Know, no, quite, no, no, no doubt. It's quite amazing. Okay, so thanks for listening. And remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe to the Talking Sopranos podcast on YouTube. Come on, we could use more subscribers. We have a ton more listeners. Help us out. Please subscribe. We got Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. And right now, you can get official Talking Sopranos merchandise on TalkingSopranos.com or through our YouTube channel. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Producer is Andy Verderam. Our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amiton. You could hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links at TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam, Ciara Sharipa, we record Talking Sopranos at NYC Podcasting. Great studios, great prices, and great people. It's the premier podcast studio in New York City. So go to nycpodcasting.com, whether you're a brand new podcast or looking to upgrade your show. They can take care of everything at nycpodcasting.com. But don't show up there just looking for Steve and I and, and bust our balls because <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll send you away. Yeah. But I tell you what, we've been using these guys from the beginning. They're terrific. Well, I worked with them on several other podcasts. And when we were looking for, for a studio and for people to work with, that, they were my first choice. And we went with them. And it's been a, been a blessing. Of course it's your first choice. Whatever you say goes. That's I'm just right. here for the ride. What, what? Was it a good choice or was it Whatever not a good choice? Whatever you say, I do. Yes, sir, was it a, was Did it work out? It worked out better than I could ever imagine. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. Whatever you want. Whatever you say, Mr. Appeal. You got it. See you next week. See you, pal.